Hi, may I take a motion to uh, return to public session? The, sorry, the board has returned from executive section, session and no actions were taken. Uh, may I have a motion to return to public? Uh, Kate, a second. Tammy, all in favor? Thank you. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Tonight we have the pleasure of hearing from our junior, senior high school students. We look forward to hearing all that is going on in their building. Oh, I think we know this student. Oh, hello. Hello. Hello, my name is Grace Stark. Um, I'm the executive secretary of the student high school and today I'll be talking about some achievements this year. So first off, the play this year was Gypsy. It was a huge success. We had a big turnout and I would like to thank Ms. McLeese for choreographing and making it a great show. Um, we had lots of participants signed up already for the junior high play. Um, debate this year, we have nine people going to states, thanks to Doc Andrews for being an excellent debate coach. We have both public forum and Lincoln Douglas qualifiers. Um, moving on, the National Honor Society Senior Dinner, dinner was an excellent event. Um, it was a dress rehearsal for Gypsy and we had Cold Spring Harbor alumni show up and the seniors were very helpful in talking to them and making sure that they had a great night. Um, everyone was involved and the student council financed this whole event. Um, this basketball season this year has been amazing. The girls made it very far, becoming county champs and heroically fighting in the Long Island Championships. The boys also had a very successful season and thanks to the girls coach Malone and boys basketball coach Merck, um, we're wishing them a very good luck se next season and hoping that they get even farther. Um, it was wonderful to see such um, big support from the community at Farmingdale College. Moving on, this year unfortunately for dodgeball we didn't have en enough teams signed up so it did not work out, but we are drawing the attention now to Battle of the Classes, which we are hoping will um, be a great event for our entire high school. So for sports night, it was very fun. All four schools attended, lots of teacher participation, and it raised around 10,000 for Corey's Promise. The Goose Hill won sports night um, for the second time in a row. Um, so from, for prom this year, um, tickets are going on sale very soon. Our venue is secured, and they are looking forward to prom. So for robotics, we had a few challenges with the robot. The team had to learn how to work together to succeed. But all in all, they learned a lot and are very excited for Hofstra, which is their next robotics competition. Um, for Locks of Love, we are looking for a new charity where we will be able to donate so that we can make um, wigs for children instead of having to cut the um, 10 inches just because it's easier. So thank you very much for your time. This is all our accomplishments. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions? Thank you for that wonderful report. Grace, you stole my thunder. <laughs> um, so now I want to introduce Tanishka Darwal, our Model UN class, pres our Model UN president. She is just going to be talking about the club this year and how it went. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Tanishka Darwal, and I'm the president of our Model United Nations Club. 
Um, our club advisor is Mr. Natali, and um, on the screens you can see the, you know, order of who's who and kind of what everyone does. So to start off, what does Model UN do year round? In the beginning of the year, we have meetings every single Tuesday. Now in the pack, because our numbers have been growing, has have been growing exponentially. Now at 126 kids with 122 attending the IMON conference, which I will explain more. Um, year round, we do extensive research on international issues and current events. We really, really, really think it's important for kids, especially our age, to kind of know what's going on around the going on around the world, and be able to be understanding of certain issues happening. Um, our training director, Hannah Stark, does training sessions to improve public speaking, negotiation, and diplomatic abilities. When going to a conference and dealing with roughly over 2,000 kids, it's very important to be able to speak to others and kind of not have stage fright, not worrying about you know, being like awkward and being able to have a free conversation. Um, our team simulate debates and negotiations to prepare for conferences where we, where we represent different countries or roles. IAMONC provides us with countries and um, kind of a committee, which I will also explain more later. Um, our Model United Nations program engages in important pillars such as leadership development and pr promotes awareness of global issues, which is very important. Moving on, how does MUN foster important skills in the participating students? Not only do you get a knowledge of current international events, it also improves research skills, which is very much needed for many of the majors that kids nowadays want to go in, STEM, business, all those types of things. Um, and it also teaches you how to research properly, check your sources and things of that nature, which allows you to make well-researched arguments, because theoretically, Model UN is debating. You're arguing your point. You're trying to make other countries agree and believe in what you say um, in order to form a block, which is a lot of countries agreeing on the one point that they fight with their chair to get resolutions approved. Um, it also enhances an understanding of international affairs while developing essential skills for future academic and professional endeavors, as I said earlier public speaking skills, and case defense and argument skills. Also very important in my opinion. Moving on, what occurs at our annual January conference? So there are three different committees that are possible that you could be in. GA, which is general, that typically has 50 to 100 kids, typically on the higher side. Specialized, you're like 40-ish, maybe max. Crisis is 15, much smaller select countries go in there, but um, it has its perks, even though it's so small. There are three days of proper debate, with the longest being four hours straight, and typically you have two, two sessions, so it can be a three-hour one, then a four-hour one. The kids really work hard to stay committed and to stay focused. The shortest one is two and a half hours, and the last day is one hour. The last day is kind of just like, you know, talk to your chair, goof off. Um, and they also do fundraising there for certain charities and um, there's like crazy competitions whichever committee raises the most money gets to do like some insane challenge like you get to pie the uh, chair's face with like a pie that they buy I don't know something fun <laughs> to keep the kids going um, a perk about being in crisis is something called the midnight crisis committee session it's supposed to be a secret but as I've been going to this conference for the last five years I'm well aware of this um, you have secretariat members come and knock on your door in the middle of the night and say, help, something's happening. Like a, country, a country's funds just got stolen by pirates. And they have to, in their PJs, go downstairs and actually go into a committee session. And then their morning committee gets canceled. But it's very fun. It typically happens on, a fr on the Friday night that we're there, around 12. It's very exciting to just see the kids like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, we have to go. And one time, um, a girl was actually just wearing a face mask, and she went downstairs with a charcoal face mask. That was really funny. Um, also, the there's an annual dinner, which I think is very fun. It's at Maggiano's on Saturday night after the Dell Fest, one of the very fun networking events that we get to attend. Um, the dinner is hosted at Maggiano's just across the street. We take chaperones with us. The whole club goes, and we do seating accordingly. Um, also across the street is Reading Market, which is where a majority of the kids get their meals from. 
uh, they have everything that you could ever imagine. All sorts of cuisines, so much food, and um, it's a really fun time. You get to see other kids from different schools there. Um, so that's the annual dinner. Um, and networking. Really, really important thing that happens here is you meet a lot of kids from different schools. This year, I, among the Ivy League Model United Nations Conference at the University of Pennsylvania, maxed out on their kids. Uh, 2,000 kids attended this conference. It was insane to say the least. Um, there were kids from, there was a school from Brazil this year and a school from China. I cannot remember the city, but you know, a lot of people come because it's a top five competition in the country. Really prestigious, really important. Um, and one of the things I want to touch upon is attire. Western business attire. What I'm wearing right now is what a typical person would wear to conference. Um, I think not only does Model UN teach people how to speak to others, it also <coughs> teaches people to kind of like stand up for themselves and just say, you know what, let's talk about this. Like that kind of importance is pretty big to me. But um, you get to meet a lot of random people from different places who have different opinions than you. And it's definitely something kind of controversial. There's a lot of arguments that happen. There's a lot of power eaters there, you know, not to say anything, but um, it's very competitive, but I think it's important for kids to be competitive in some nature because it teaches kids to keep on fighting, keep fighting on what you believe in. And I just want to thank everything. Like Model UN has done so much for me as a person. I joined in eighth grade and I was one of the nine eighth graders that were there. I was the only girl on the trip, which actually my parents came on the trip because they were nervous for me. <laughs> I was the only kid who had her parents come, but it's okay. I'm very grateful that they were there because I was very nervous. Um, and actually, in my room that first year, um, Katie Belfi, she was uh, now, I, I forgot where she's at right now, but um, she was in crisis committee and I got so scared. Some person came and knocked on the door, and I was fast asleep, and someone was like, get up, get up, something's happening. And I was like, what? Very scary, but very fun. Um, yeah, and I would like to show this cute little slideshow of kind of, does this cursor work? How does this work? Is this? That's just a dinner at Maggiano's and opening ceremony. So that's kind of that. Real quickly, I want to thank the people that I worked with this year. Um, everyone here worked tooth and nail to make this conference go smoothly. We had a lot of ups and downs with security detail, room checking, and um, I also want to really emphasize that all of the chaperones and Mission Tally really, really, really worked overtime to try to make this whole thing come together really nicely and keep everyone safe and sound. Um, and I worked with these people every single day. I mean, I was at Mr. Natalie's desk maybe four times a week. It was a little concerning how much I saw him. <laughs> but um, yes, and I would also like to thank you all for all the help that you've given us. I really appreciate it. This club is like one of the pillars in my life, and I appreciate everything you do for us. Aww. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions on how this runs, any other things like that. I just want to say um, it's so wonderful seeing your presentation and seeing, I like, am getting emotional thinking about it, like what a lovely young world leader we have yeah, developed and having you come here to thank us for what we've done. We thank you for all of your hard work 
and for representing Cold Spring Harbor so beautifully at Model UN for all these years. So thank you very much. And I don't know if anyone else here did Model UN in high school, anyone else? But it's, uh, I don't remember, do you remember being woken up in the middle of the night? I think we missed out on some cool traditions, Christine. So that, I'm glad to hear that it's um, developing and growing and really still such an enriching, even more enriching experience today. Thank you very much. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you. So um, as uh, president of the board, I have uh, just a few statements to make. We are, as you know, in budget season. And um, I just have like a little housekeeping before we continue with the meeting, which is that we have an extra budget meeting coming up. And um, so on the 25th at 6.30 p.m., we'll have a second meeting dedicated um, strictly to discussion of the budget. So because of that, we're going to um, limit our questions this evening uh, after the presentation so that we can get really in depth at the next meeting. And I know the weather's changing. It was beautiful out today. But if you can pull yourselves away from the brighter skies and the warmer weather, we um, it is a public meeting. And we'd love to have people there um, for the in-depth Q&A on the budget. So thank you um, very much for that. And um, I am now going to turn the meeting over to the superintendent for her report. Good evening, everyone. Um, so as Grace mentioned, we had sports night uh, on Thursday evening. We had over 1,100 attendees, student volunteers, teachers, staff, and administrators um, to come together for this special event. So this was our second annual sports night. Um, in memory of Corey Fallon, Chris Fallon's uh, son who passed away from pediatric cancer. And again, I just wanna say thank you to our community for their outpouring of support and their generous donations. Uh, we raised over $10,000 for this event. Um, the final calculations haven't been made, but I know that um, we've raised at least 10,000. Um, so again, just a wonderful night. Um, I love to see the junior, senior high school kids come out and say, how come we didn't have this event? Um, but the little ones <laughs> screaming and yelling, I think either the parents were happy with us because they passed out when they got home some t from being so tired and dancing or um, they were just so wired <laughs> going back <laughs> home. Um, but again, it was a great night. And again, I want to thank our teachers and staff. Our custodians participated. It just really was a wonderful event. We had um, our entire security team. I think, um, Joe, right, we had two parking spaces left um, at the end of the evening. So again, <laughs> thank you again to our PGGs for all their generous donations. They paid for all the t-shirts for the staff and to our community who donated food um, for our staff for that evening. Um, we have our junior, senior high school musical coming up of Footloose. Um, it will be taking place Friday and Saturday, March 22nd and 23rd at 7 p.m. and Sunday, March 24th at 2 o'clock p.m. in the pack. Um, I am thrilled at this year's selection and here the students love this one too. So um, tickets are still available if you are interested in attending and you can come to our website for that. Um, this Thursday, we have International in Light um, being hosted by the Junior Senior High School at 6, six o'clock p.m. Um, again, it is expected that this year's event will be um, a wonderful showing of our community. Um, I want to thank Mrs. Mon Monk Rally for her coordination. A lot goes into this evening. Um, our families prepare and share dishes dishes traditional to their heritage. Um, there are also numerous projects on the various countries that represent our community. Um, we'll have some student performances and I heard you should come hungry. Um, some Greek food possibly and what else Christine? We have wontons and um, possibly some henna tattoos. Um, as uh, Grace mentioned the girls and boy girls basketball team class A champions a champion played in the class A championship. I know um, Alex was there joined by many of our staff members. It was just so nice to see how many teachers and staff came out to support the kids. Um, they lost 32 to 30 um, within the last few minutes and they led uh, the first quarter really almost up till the first half. But I, I think what's most impressive is uh, the students' perseverance and the grace. Um, they fought 
fiercely all the way to the end of that match. And Mr. Bongino, I saw you on the sideline screaming your head off. Um, you know, I think if you could have jumped on the court, you would have. <laughs> but again, congratulations to the girls, um, Mr. Malone and um, Mr. Forbes for their coaching. And they were just so proud of the kids. Um, the boys basketball team also competed in the Nassau County semifinal round against North Shore. They, too, came up just slightly short in that match. Um, we were up, you know, pretty much most of the game. I mean, if we fell short, it was within three points. And then, you know, of course, in the last few minutes, it was 47, I think, Mike, 39 um, at the very end. But, you know, it's just all the fouling. It's all, yeah. So, again, um, but congratulations to both teams on incredible seasons. I'm, I'm really proud to share that our students had an amazing day at the Long Island Science and Engineering Fair um, on Tuesday, March 5th. Isabel uh, Babelian won honorable mention from LICEF, which, which is the Long Island Science and Engineering Fair. Um, she won this special award from the United States Agency for International Development for her research on neural links. Um, additionally, Milan Lustig, who you hear very um, a lot about through our um, competitions, our most recent competition, um, he's been competing in, in numerous science STEM competitions, but he won first place at LICEF on his research on compliers uh, and will be re representing Cold Spring Harbor School at the Regeneron International Science and Engineering Fair in Los Angeles in May. So the fact that he has gone this far is really an incredible accomplishment. Um, as all of you know, this year we started our AP seminar class, AP capstone seminar. Next year we'll run our AP research class, and we're hoping we get some more Regeneron uh, finalists out of that competition and those students moving up in their research project. But again, these are remarkable achievements and are a testament to the hard work of our students and staff. Mr. Radsap um, really coaches these students through their work. Uh, just a quick update on our UPK program um, that the board approved at the last meeting. We have 75 families who completed the application. Um, so as you know, we have 36 slots. Um, the due date for this is March 18th, and the lottery will be held on the 25th at 2 p.m. So um, a really nice response from our community. Ms. Lagatuda held some parent informational evenings. Thank you, Mrs. Lagatuda, and for putting all the particulars together. So I know this is a, a, a large undertaking. The literary luncheon is also scheduled next week, hosted by the Cold Spring Harbor PTG, and they've done a terrific job selecting the author of The Violin Conspiracy, conspiracy um, this was, which was written by Brendan Slocum. Um, the Violin Conspiracy is about a black massacre black classical musician's desperate quest to recover his lost violin on the eve of the most prestigious musical competition in the world. Um, we cannot wait to meet Mr. Slocum. He'll be visiting the junior senior high school. Um, and it, uh, again, this the literary luncheon always proves to be a really nice event for our community and raises um, funds for the junior senior high school. Um, K through six report cards will be posted on March 20th. So look for an email notification notification on that this week we have on thursday our cpc meeting which um, we will share local assessments and how to utilize that information to inform instruction um, as well k through parents for the first time ever have received uh, parent reports with our star assessments and so that is something new that we've introduced although we've been um, had the star assessments which are local assessments for many years the parent reports haven't been shared so again mrs lagatuda thank you um, for sharing that information and also hosting some parent nights to understand those reports. Um, I hope everyone had the opportunity to read the latest copy of the Harbor Highlights. Um, this was really a special edition because it was dedicated to the achievement of our students, staff, and um, our teachers. So again, really an amazing, that entire, I mean, I, there wasn't enough space to really highlight all the accomplishments. Um, Let's see what else we have coming up. Easter spring re recess, March 28th through April 2nd. And then we have a scope dinner that honors three employees from our district. And this year it is Nancy Festuca, our West Side aide who just recently retired. Karen Spaler. Karen, is she still here? Did she? Oh, she's in the back. Congratulations, Karen, our publicist. And Denise Vigilor, our high school principal assistant. Um, who will be receiving these awards this year. Karen, congratulations, and thank you so much for all you do. 
So I have some personal news to share. Um, after three fulfilling years in Cold Spring Harbor and a 35-year career in education, I am announcing my retirement. So um, it has been an honor and a privilege to serve alongside such a dedicated community. And I want to express my deepest gratitude to everyone who has contributed to the positive changes we have accomplished together. From recovering after a pandemic when we came in to advancing academic results, hiring exceptional educators, upgrading our facilities, enhancing our safety protocols, and the inclusion of numerous community building activities that have united us, we have made a difference in the lives of our students. It has been a joy to spend my career doing what I love most, working with children. I am incredibly proud of our students and their remarkable achievements. Witnessing their growth over the years has been truly, has been truly rewarding and I am grateful to have been part of their journey. Their development cannot happen without the love and support of our families, teachers, staff, administrators, and our Board of Education who I'm, for whom I am eternally grateful. Keep believing in them and creating a safe place that motivates them to be the leaders and innovators of tomorrow. I will continue to cheer you on. While my time in the district is coming to a close at the end of June, I am committed to seeing through the CVA litigation against the insurance carriers we currently have underway. I have agreed to make myself available to assist with these lawsuits, ensuring that our efforts to recover the funding due to the children of today and tomorrow continues to be our collective priority. And as I transition into retirement, I look forward to spending time with my family and friends, including my new great niece, Lane, and my nephew, Presley. I'm not sure he's gonna be so happy that I have extra time on my hands, but we'll see. Um, being more involved in their educational journey and catching up on their experiences I have missed will be on my to-do list. Thank you again to everyone who's been part of our success together. I will cherish the relationships made, and I see so many of you out there tonight, especially those that care deeply about children, one another, the work that they do, and giving tirelessly to this district. Special thank you to my central office team, and Liz Lynch, the kindest and most dedicated member that holds the district together. She's two doors away and a phone call away <laughs> at any moment. But the memories and experiences I have gained, along with the support and camaraderie of this community, have meant the world to me. Cold Spring Arbor will always hold a special place in my heart. And thank you again to this community for the job offer and a great run for the past three years. So thank you. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the board, I want to express our gratitude to you for your service and for your commitment to our schools over these past three years. And I know, uh, Tammy, you wanted to say a little something well, also. It's been yeah. A pleasure working with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, it's hard to follow that, but here we go. We've got a full meeting here. So, um, to order. We're going to go out of order, and uh, we are going to move on to the presentation on uh, integrating co-teach model at our elementary school. Okay, at this time I'd like to invite up Dr. Nicole Schimpf, who will be presenting uh, this model to the Board of Education. Uh, this has been a work in progress over um, the past couple months. Dr. Schimpf has just joined us this year, and yet she has really dug in to take a look at the services of our children and really see the best delivery model for them. And I know this has been, I see a lot of SEPTO parents out there tonight. Thanks for joining us. And I know some of you have children that are no longer in the elementary level, but have been advocating for this service for many years. Um, so this is really an opportunity um, to look at the staffing um, of our, the staffing for our children. Many of our kids right now um, who need uh, more direct services get that through a double resource room period 
or through some very creative model since we haven't had the program in place. And although this is an ICT program, integrated co-taught classes are not required to be on the continuum through the State Education Department for Special Education Services. It is a wonderful model to be able to keep students in the classroom with their peers and then getting the additional supports they need in the academic areas. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Schimpf who's going to explain a little bit more about the ICT model and why this um, could benefit our students. Um, I'm going to just caution everybody as we, as we look at this presentation, this is an introduction to in integrated co-teaching classes. So it's kind of a phase in model. We have a couple proposals for the board to consider. Um, a s kind of slow roll if we did a couple of sections and then a just a little bit more of an advanced model. The concerns that the um, administrators in the past have had and all very legitimate as well as our current administration is that at times you might not have enough students to really support a teacher at both West Side and Lord Har Lloyd Harbor. So um, many districts who experience low class, you know, have smaller class sizes and not the needs, um, place students at one of the schools. So one of the schools becomes the ICT model or a grade level becomes the ICT model at, you know, for second grade coming in, it'll be at West Side. Maybe the next year, the second grade would be at Lloyd Harbor. And then those kids who are in those sections would then continue to stay, remain in those buildings for future years through sixth grade. So um, we want to, you know, ensure consistency for those families and kind of put a guarantee in place when those decisions are being made throughout the CSE process. Um, so it, it's a commitment on behalf of the Board of Education. Uh, but I'm, Nicole, I'm gonna at this time I'm gonna let you take over. And again, thank you so much for putting this together. I mean, for a very short period of time with your experience, we appreciate your input. Thank you. I just wanted to thank the board um, for giving us this opportunity to have this candid conversation. Just make sure you speak in the mic because it's recorded and people won't be able to hear it otherwise. Okay. Can thank you. Hear you. That? A little, a little closer. closer. <laughs> we all want to hear what you have to say. Okay. So I just wanted to thank the board for giving uh, this opportunity to have this candid conversation. Um, for the past five months um, since I have come to Cold Spring Harbor, I really have had the opportunity to see the course offerings that are available to our students with disabilities. Um, and by me saying I having the opportunity, I have had numerous conversations with staff, received some parent feedback, and really looking at the student profiles at the elementary school level. At the secondary level, for those of you who know, we do have integrated co-teaching classrooms at the secondary level. And the proposal for this evening is really to expand that model to the elementary school, which all my decision making was really based upon two things. One was student centered and the other piece was forward thinking. Really thinking about how we can have our students be successful academically and social emotionally and how we can maintain that inclusive model. So as was just shared with you, we do have a various levels of support. We are very fortunate of having creative ways of supporting our students with disabilities. But this evening what I'm going to share with you is a different model, similar to the secondary level, but unique because it is at the elementary school level developmentally. Um, it is an optional program through the New York State Continuum of Services, but I can share with you, I did do a survey with neighboring districts just to see how many had elementary ICT models, and I can share with you, because I do know from conversations sitting in other board presentations, just looking to see what we offer compared to other districts. Um, all the neighboring districts, including Syosset and Jericho, all have an elementary school ICT model. The only school district that does not have an ICT model at the elementary school level for comparison is Roslyn. Okay. So let's begin having the conversation. Thank you. 
Okay, so looking at an integrated co-teaching model, the ultimate goal is to give equal access to all children, children with disabilities as well as general education students. So all of our students, just so you know, we have 206 students district-wide that have an IEP, 206, K through, K through 12. Um, that's 13% of our student population. A majority of those students, I would say to you, at least 90 to 95 percent are already in our general education classrooms, getting some support by our special education teachers. Typically what that looks like is a combination of a push-in, pull-out model, resource room every day, and then the special education teacher pushes into the room about two days a week for 40 minutes. The difference with the ICT model is more contact time with the students with special needs in those classrooms, the general education classrooms, as well as in a consultant teacher model, it's really focusing on the special education students. In an ICT model, it's really looking at supporting the entire class and all students, both students with disabilities and typical peers would benefit by having two teachers in a room. Also looking at the needs of our students, there is a need of really looking to see there are students that do need more supports. We are delivering it with a combination of that resource room model, but more time accessing the general education curriculum can only help our students. So what does an ICT model would look like at Cold Spring Harbor? What I am proposing is a part-time part model um, meeting the needs of our students. So looking at having two certified teachers in the room, the general education teacher and the special education teacher. And I can tell you I've had, had conversations with, with all of our special education teachers at Westside and Lloyd Harbor, and they have also spoken to the general education teachers to get their feedback if we were to move with this model. So there would be two teachers in the room, the special education teacher would be in the room for the ELA block, the reading, the writing, which is a double block, and the math block. That is where our students need the most help, and that is where we see even typical peers who are receiving some form of AIS services could benefit from having two teachers in the room, which basically would mean more time and attention to all students and more small group instruction. Also, when you look at the ICT model, it would be a um, 10 hours a week on the IEP, which is significant more time than what the special education students would be receiving right now. It would also include, since we're not having a full-time special education teacher in the room, I am proposing having a teacher assistant in the room when the special education teacher is not there. So that would be for the other content areas like social studies and science. Now, what is the profile of a student that would be entering an ICT model? All right, much discussion with the staff, really looking at the IEPs and really getting the feedback from the staff. What we are looking at is really having the model based upon if a student has academic needs in reading, writing, and math, and also we do have a number of students, in addition to that, have a combination of having some needs in executive functioning, study skills, some attentional difficulties. We are not looking at having this model, um, because I do know that it was a concern by the community, of having all students with severe behavior difficulties in those classrooms. That is not the intent of these classrooms. When you're looking at how do teachers work together? We are looking at including common planning time, at least one period per week when possible. That is a critical component of ICT, is that both teachers have an opportunity of planning lessons together, modifying, differentiating. All of that work is in the planning. When it's a true ICT classroom, from my experience, it's a true marriage. The students will not know who the special education teacher is or the general education teacher. They are working in unison. In regard to how many students that we could place in an ICT classroom, as per the regulations, it's no more than 50 percent. 
or 12 students that have an IEP. This would be a scheduling thing that we will be looking at because it's not just students that are recommended for ICT, it's any student with an IEP should not be placed in those classrooms because we don't want to overload those classrooms. We want all the classrooms to be equitable and to be um, performing at optimal levels for teaching and learning for all of our children. When you look at the numbers that I'm proposing, we're not even close to 12. We are a very small school district. I did look at grades of where there were students that we could run ICT, and those will be the two proposals that I have for you this evening. What are some advantages of this model? Of course, including inclusive learning environments. I must tell you, though, Cold Spring Harbor does a very good job with this. We have been extremely creative. Our special education teachers go above and beyond making this happen. We are just getting their feedback and really looking at the needs of our students as we're moving forward and understanding the ex academic expectations as they get to the secondary level. The second bu bullet I think is critical because from my experience and talking to general education, families, and other districts, they once they know what ICT is, they want their child to be in this, pro in this, pro in this classroom because there's two teachers. So not only is students who are struggling going to get extra support, it's also the enrichment. And it allows the general education teacher to provide more enrichment because they do have an extra pair of hands. And it's not just an aide, it's in a full um, special education teacher with that expertise. Differentiated instruction I did share with you. A big, a big concern that I hear from families is in regard to pullouts. How much pullouts does my child have in regard to related services, in regard to academic support? This would actually reduce or eliminate the number of pullouts because if a child is being recommended for ICT, there is no pullouts other than what's on the child's IEP as it relates to related services, speech, OT, counseling. Definitely there would be less, a loss, of, less loss of instructional time in regard to the movement of students going in and out. Uh, definitely an increase of collaboration skills, not only for the students, but for the teachers. It will in promote and ensure a growth mindset, which we have really been instilling in this district. Um, and also in regard to the social skills development. There are benefits and the research does indicate there is a lot of research of the, of the effectiveness of ICT. So looking at our numbers, what I did was a comparison between West Side and Lloyd Harbor. I just want to be clear that this does not mean that Goose Hill was left out. Um, Goose Hill, as what we just, what you just heard, this is different stages. This is not a one-year um, commitment. So we are looking at the first stage to be Lloyd Harbor and West Side. That's where the higher uh, expectations are and the work demands and that's where we're seeing the needs for our students. So you can see from the numbers, the numbers are pretty small, um, but they are very manageable. So if we were to go with this model, we would be um, 27 students in Lloyd Harbor would receive that benefit, uh, 16 students at Westside would receive that benefit. Again, this is all based upon CSE recommendations. If the parents are supportive of this after we're uh, discussing it, I've had had CSE meetings. Um, we have made recommendations based upon current program offerings, but I have shared that this was a proposal just to get the feedback from the, pam the families in regard to if this was to be offered, would you be open to this? This is what is being recommended if it was to be approved. Um, and that is just logistically, we cannot have the CSE meetings running again. We're talking about a significant number. But parents do know that all of these I IEPs are on hold um, and it won't be finalized until all decisions are rendered. Any questions with this slide before I move on? What, so, what were the students again? I just can't do the math that fast. How many in each school? So 27 students in Lloyd Harbor um, would be projected to go into ICT classrooms and 16 at Westside. 
and you, you can see the breakdown by the grades. And I also have on the right-hand side, just so you can make a comparative analysis of the students that are remaining that are not being recommended for ICT, and we are maintaining all of our current program offerings in addition to the ICT model. Kate, just talk into the mic for the recording, please. Thank you. I always get in trouble for that. You're not so in trouble, it's just a reminder. <laughs> <laughs> so if the, um, I kind of lost track of what I was going to say. Oh, so the other students with IEPs that are not going to be in the ICT, they're still getting the pullout resource room. That will lower the group sizes, am I correct, in the resource It may room? lower the group sizes. Also, it's going to reduce the number of students that are getting consultant teacher. Right. This is the reason why you don't see such a significant expense. Um, but I did, I did include in regard to the increases per grade when we get to this slide. Um, and that takes into account the students that are not being projected for ICT. So for example, you know, if you look at third grade, third grade, you know, we're expecting to have six students that are not being recommended for ICT. And whatever that recommendation is being made by CSE, which again, you know, there was projections based upon their present levels of performance, um, that is going to be presented to the parents. Um, and that's based upon this. But again, from the onset that I, and I wrote it in the f cover, this is all subject to CSE recommendations. Right. Okay. So if we look at this proposal, which is proposal one, with a cost attached to it, um, proposal one is basically recommending a total of seven sections across West Side and Lloyd Harbor to begin the phase of ICT at Cold Spring Harbor. So second grade, for example. Second grade, there is a number of students that are coming from Goose Hill. Out of the uh, three, there's only three students in Westside that are going to be going from Goose Hill to Westside. Two of those students are being proposed for ICT based upon the recommendations of Goose Hill. Um, and there's been conversations between Westside and Goose Hill in regard to what the present levels are and if there are concerns about needing more supports. Westside and Lloyd Harbor, I am proposing that both schools have an ICT model uh, for third grade and fourth grade. And that's based upon the numbers that we were able to cluster and in regard to some of the feedback from the families. Fifth grade and sixth grade, as you can see, that is where is our heaviest need for ICT and where our highest numbers are. So Lloyd Harbor, I'm anticipating six to eight that will be recommended for ICT and sixth grade six to seven. That does not include West Side with those numbers. And as you can see on the right side, any if even if ICT is being recommended at Lloyd Harbor, West Side families would have access to it uh, if they choose to want to move to Lloyd Harbor. The reason why they're not on there now is because we didn't anticipate at the end of a child's elementary school experience wanting to change two years out after they've been there for a number of years. So, um, however, based on Nicole's conversations with some of the parents, there may be one or two parents, believe it or not, in fifth or sixth grade that actually might want to change for the year or two years. And it's not that they have to <coughs> move to, to Lloyd Harbor. The child, uh, that's just how right, it came out. They would be the child would just have transportation yes. there. Right. Yes, would, thank would, you. Child. Would the school um, provide the transportation or would the family have to provide the school it? So we would, <coughs> how would that wor work with our busing? It would depend how many students, Heather, we'd have to look at it at the time, whether they're a shuttle type service where they go to their residential home you know, school like Westside, and they get shuttled over to Lloyd Harbor because there's a certain number of them, or th whether they directly just go from home to, to Lloyd Harbor. Okay. So looking at the cost of this particular model, um, there was some adjustments as of March 11th, if you see the number did go down. Um, this is all based upon district-wide projections, you know. We are in the midst of having conversations across all of our schools. So with all the increases from second to sixth grade, th that totals a 
uh, FTE increase, but with the district-wide projections, we are only needing to ask for a 0.6 increase uh, for s new staffing. So that would that brought down the number for seven sections. Again, uh, there will be no shared aids. We would be hiring teacher assistants. The sum total is 127,000 for seven sections. I have another question. Yes. So if the children, students at Westside, the three students in fifth grade, the three students in sixth grade, and the two students in second grade decide not to avail themselves of the ICT and transport, is that the, we're still providing the same resource room and those <coughs> costs are included in the 127000 Yes. Could that go down if they decided to? So in my special uh, student service budget, it does include as if we were keeping all current programs. So this is an increase. There may be a decrease in regard to if some parents do not take advantage of this. Um, but in regard to Lloyd Harbor, for example, second grade, those students then would be back absorbed in Westside. So I did not count them in Westside right now. Okay. The incoming kindergarten, just so you know. Okay. Okay. Um, Lloyd Harbor for fifth and sixth grade, again, if they were to absorb those Westside students, which, which we did not count because we did not initially think that families may be interested to move at that upper grade level. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, parents, you know, may have preferences, but they're, they're really thinking and making informed decisions of what they feel is in the best interest of their, chi of their child. So we are closely monitoring fifth and sixth grade. Hypothetically, if all the Lloyd Harbor parents say yes, and then the three of the West Side parents say yes, you know, we, we do have to closely monitor that. But also in those, just hypothetically saying, the three students from each of those grades uh, from Westside moved over to Lloyd Harbor, that would make sections of 9 to 11 in those mm -hmm. grades. And we'd likely need two sections because you need to keep the 50%, no more than 50%, and our class sizes aren't that high in those grades. So you would technically need two sections to so run those classes. So. It's kind of a wash because you're providing the service at West Side right now, and if they move over to the other side, the services mm -hmm. move mm -hmm. with them. Okay. So, would you provide <coughs> one class at West Side then, and one at Lloyd Harbor? Like, how you were you to put two? That could be a possibility, absolutely. If all three, and then just we'd have to determine. We'd have to really take a look at the six to eight, mm -hmm. and are all those parents agreeable? Just because it's there doesn't mean they're necessarily going to be agreeable to that. So I don't want to promise that it would be at both buildings until I really see the big picture of where all the students. So what happens if they're <coughs> not agreeable to, I'm talking now, res talking with respect to like fifth grade Lloyd Harbor. Say there's a couple of parents that are not agreeable to that. They, those students can choose to go to, elect to go to resource room mm -hmm. and they'll keep their services that they're getting as is. Yep. And that's a family to family decision mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at this point. No, obviously the CSE is a committee decision mm -hmm. and there's you know recommendations mm -hmm. based on that committee, but yes, we parents have uh, you they know, can the opt greater out say, of the recommendation. Um, and then in those cases, so just say three of them only opted in and then the three from West Side went that would be six and that would be certainly <laughs> allowable under the guidelines to provide ICT. So as um, Mrs. Dela Della Carpini mentioned, you know, the students in the resource room, we have up to five students in a resource room. Typically, we don't run classes that high, but they could be, you know, three kids in a class right now, and now it's down to two, or three, and it's down to one. It really is going to depend on the CSEs. So this is a moving target until we have all those CSEs. Right. So these are, these are <coughs> estimates, um, and, sure. you know, right now, I am operating of balancing both right now. So, you know, as we get closer to a decision, we can give you those exact numbers. Um, but if you look at West Side for third grade, there's no increase at all because all the students in that particular grade, for example, are being recommended for ICT. Okay, um, Dr. Schimpf, we're gonna move this along okay. just because we have a um, pretty mm -hmm. 
heavy um, budget proposal this evening, but uh, for the board members, if you have additional questions, we're happy to take them and answer them also at the meeting on the 25th. Okay, so the you. last proposal, um, and if you're focusing on proposal one, that's great. Proposal two is just really looking at reducing the sections and really focusing on using Lloyd Harbor as the feeder school and having the classes just second, fifth, and sixth. Um, you can see that the course is not a significant difference yeah. uh, just because Lloyd Harbor will be absorbing a lot of that in regard to taking on the West Side students. The so is there, if you're taking on the West Side students at Lloyd Harbor, we're still considering a .5 when there's going to be more students in there with IEPs? Point five is, I would say to you, is generous. You know, I, I overestimated in the sense of if you look at the increases, but I'm also looking to see in regard to just placeholders of, of things as well. So I'm only, off, I'm only indicating point six for proposal one and point five for proposal two based upon each one of the grade increases or decreases. And our current staffing models that are already at those buildings. Right. So, so with six to eight IEP students, you would, is, is you're still going to have a .5. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. The, the, the number of students classified that we're proposing yeah. in the ICT classrooms would not be changing regardless of what proposal is. And students. you think that uh, their goals can be met with eight students with an IEP for half day? <coughs> one thing, regardless of the proposal, proposal one or two, like I said, we're closely monitoring fifth and sixth grade to see how many students we actually have to see if we need to split it and possibly one go to one school versus another. Mm -hmm. But I've been in districts where they can go up to, I like to keep them in the single digits, but I've had eight to nine students easily in an ICT classroom, especially with a teacher assistant and a, and a certified special education teacher. Okay, thank you. The last, the last slide uh, is not part of the IICT proposal, but I will discuss it later in the uh, budget presentation. This is the West Side self-contained special classroom, so I will hold that to the budget presentation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we're going to move on to a budget review. And as a reminder, we will be having a second meeting on March 25th. So we're going to have about 15 minutes for this presentation and then just information gathering questions at the end for the next meeting on the 25th. Thank you. Welcome everyone to the second budget review session during our budget development season. We're going to start off where we ended our last meeting and we're just going to look at the components of the budget and we're going to go over some updates as to where we are since our last meeting. <coughs> since our last meeting we talk about the tax levy and we know that it's governed by legislation and it's a formula. Here is our tax cap calculation. Um, 71035000 is our maximum allowable tax levy. It's a 2.12% increase over the prior year's tax levy. It requires a simple majority vote. And this tax levy was required to be filed with the controller's office on March 1st. Can be changed any time after that. In our next slide, this is the filing with the controller's office on the left. And here on the right are just some tax cap data information for the board or the public to look at on their own. This is where districts in Nassau, Suffolk, and Long Island are cur currently coming in. Um, you'll see the information here. Currently, three districts are scheduled to go out with a 0% increase, and four districts are planning to exceed the maximum allowable tax levy. So at, at our, um, one of the board trustees asked a question about in the current year's budget, not the one we're developing 24-25, there is a line item called transfer to capital, and it was voted on last year for a security booth. So it may seem out of order here, but there's a reason that we're going to talk about it right, near, right here, because 
What we do with that money in this year's budget could affect our tax cap calculation for the budget we're developing in 24-25. So this is a screenshot of our budget brochure or budget newsletter that was mailed home to the public. In that budget newsletter, you see I highlighted it in yellow. It actually speaks about that one line item in the budget includes a transfer to capital for 350,000 for a security booth. But it's actually the words after that that we're gonna be discussing. The words after that actually say that these monies at the discretion of the Board of Education can be reallocated for unanticipated contingent expenses. So a question was asked by the board about unanticipated contingent expenses. After, um, after advice of our council in speaking about this, we can repurpose the monies in the transfer to capital line for our security booth this year. We do have unanticipated contingent expenses related to our CVA litigation and the payment plan. Those unanticipated expenses exceed $350,000. So that is an um, option that the board can take. They can repurpose those monies. So because of that, it's important now that we, we, we trace back as to how that would affect the tax cap calculation for the budget that we're developing for 24-25. Because if that decision is made by the board, it affects the tax cap calculation next year. So here on this slide, it's the, it's the potential effect of that decision, if you do make that, on the tax cap. So it would be, here's the security booth. If you move forward, as it was voted on last May, and do the security booth, as you saw, our maximum allowable levy is 2.12% filed with the controller's office. If the decision is made to not move forward with the security booth, and declare those expenses for unanticipated CVA costs, our tax levy actually changes to 1.62%. We're gonna go over that. And also, we, it's important that we take the tax cap calculation potentially forward one more year. And that's because that the transfer to capital line affects the tax cap calculation in out years. So while we don't know all the elements that will affect the tax cap in the out years, we can at least use assumptions and look at that. So for the following year, this would be the 25-26 uh, development of our budget. We would see that if we included a transfer to capital in the budget we're building now, our maximum allowable levy would be about 1.65%. And if we decide not to include in the current budget the transfer to capital line, our maximum allowable levy would be about 1.16%. On the other side of this tree, we see that if we don't do the security booth, but we do put money in next year's budget for a transfer to capital, our maximum allowable levy is 165. And again, if we don't put money in this year's budget for transfer to capital, our maximum allowable levy is 1.16. And we're gonna talk in a later slide about, about what the transfer to capital number in the budget we're now developing for 24-25 might look like, what projects it would cover. That would come later. So the question is, what's changed? Why did it change from 2.12 to 1.62? And here is our tax cap calculation um, with the adjustment. And this is the number right here, I'm gonna click here. This is the number that is impacted by us not doing the security booth and repurposing those monies for unanticipated contingent expenses. And just, I don't expect you to you know, know all the details, but this is the detail behind just that one calculation on the right. That one calculation on the right, this is the number that would reduce by $350,000. When you add that down to the bottom, that 3.4 million actually turns into 3,074, and that 3,074 goes here, and the math down on the tax calculation changes that maximum allowable levy to 70.6 million, or an increase of 1.62%. That is a direct impact on the on that calculation. So that's really the details behind it. Um, just going back to this tree, I'm not gonna go over each of these um, calculations for the out year 24-25, but the next four slides in the presentation are the details of those if you're interested in looking at them. So I'm actually going to just click through the next four slides because they're just the details of those items that I had boxed off. So we're gonna move forward in our conversation about one of the components of our budget again is state aid. Hot off the presses, while this slide says that we're waiting for one house budgets to come out next week, well they were released today, this afternoon at about one o'clock. So I read them very quickly. Um, as expected, the 
Senate and the Assembly have come forward with budgets that they do not support the hold harmless provision proposed in Governor Hochul's budget. It is great to see that both houses agree on that. And both houses actually are proposing a 3% increase to minimum foundation aid for the district. So we'll see that as we move through the presentations, as there's going to be estimates of that as we move forward. So we can concentrate our conversations, maybe a little more there, because that seems likely as we move through the process when both when both sides of the, the assembly and the, the Senate and the assembly agree, um, we can forecast that we think we know where things may land. So we're going to move this forward. And as we discuss, but there is an interesting piece to speak about because there's been multiple indications of a late budget and that has been confirmed in recent things that have been published with as much as Hochul even indicating that she didn't want any religious observances to be interrupted of the people up in Albany. So that's not a great sign that we may not have an on-time budget. We're scheduled to adopt our budget on April 16th. The last day we can do it by law is April 23rd, just as we note that in case that's something that we're considering. So last item that is on the revenue side of the house that supports our budget is, is the other category. There are really no updates from our meeting last time we met in February, so we're gonna move past this. We're actually gonna take a closer look at the budget now. So here's, here's our budget. We spoke about it last time when we actually look at where we were. This is where we were at our last meeting on February 27th. We were proposing an $80.1 million budget. It was a $3 million increase over the prior, you know, over the current year's budget, the 23-24 budget. I just want to rest on here for a minute and have a conversation about the budget drivers. These really are the six categories categorically that are driving this $3 million increase. I put them in um, descending order so that you can see which items are affecting the most across all categories. Benefits, our debt and transfers are really driving it. $1.1 million of that three million is addressed just for that. And the majority of that is a health insurance increase. Contractual increases are non-salary increases. They include things like um, services we provide, utilities that we pay, repairs that we might have to do with outside organizations, and they run the gamut across the whole budget. Those drivers are about a $700,000 $700, increase. Collective bargaining agreement increases are approximately $400,000 driver in the budget increase. Uh, transportation is about a $300,000 driver in this budget. And um, as the board knows, there's information on the table by the 25th when we meet at our special meeting we will have additional information on transportation. And um, we're working through it with our attorneys and we hope to have you know, answers there. Security is a large driver in the increase. We have seen a lot of additional use of security. This is really truing up our security for what's actually happening across the district in the last year and this brings that forward. And legal costs are really driving by the CVA cases we currently have ongoing with the, with the um, insurance carriers. So this is really the detail and categorically like where, where this three million is falling. I'll just rest there in one minute. I'm gonna bring it forward to the version of the budget right now. So that was at our last meeting. Now I'm gonna bring it forward to tonight, 312. Okay, this is the budget, February 27th, and the green arrow is actually showing you that's where we were. And there's been $28,000 of changes to the budget since our last meeting. Those fall into four areas. ERS, we got additional salary updates from the retirement system. We had to make an adjustment. We made an adjustment in human resources for um, updated information that we had. The board added UPK at the last meeting. Those, those numbers are there. And at the last meeting, the board may remember that they approved lane changes for teachers, and those have to be moved forward into the next year budget. So here, oh, sorry, I clicked too fast. So our current budget went from 80 million I think that says 162, we're at 80 million 190 as of tonight. And here we are at the 80 million 190 in the five categories that are the state standards on how we present. So inside this budget of this 80 million 190 is a transfer to capital line. That transfer to capital line is $350,000 in the budget that we're developing. And in consult with our architect, we are uh, proposing that transfer to capital line address the following items in our building condition survey that was just released. 
these are things that have to be done to keep up. We have about half a million dollars of square footage in our buildings. This is just keeping up our buildings. It includes district-wide exterior replacement of doors and hardening, sidewalk and curb replacements district-wide, and exterior masonry and chimney reconstructions that need, to, that need to happen in the district. So that's the proposal. We believe that all three of those could, be, um, could happen with the $350,000. Just as a point of reference, the sidewalks and curbs alone are not aidable, but when we pair them with other projects that are aidable, they, they garner aid from the state, building aid. So we will be careful as to how we bid out, how we do jobs to make sure we're garnering the building aid on every one of these projects. Okay, so the budget as we sit tonight on March 12th still has additional budgetary considerations. At our last meeting, we talked about items that are not currently in the budget. So from our at last meeting, you may see that there's more colors on this page. Certain things are crossed out, either from new estimates or they have already been worked into the budget. The first one is UPK. But I want to bring to your note that we only worked into the budget $24,400 into next year's budget because the furniture items that will be needed for UPK, we believe we can cover those in this year's current budget based on where we're estimated to come out at the end of this year. The Aquarist has been removed from the budget as we have finished, um, students have finished up signing up for classes. We realize that um, we may be able to handle the Aquarist responsibilities in a different manner, and we have removed them from consideration. And the other items that you see in green on this screen, while they're not built into the budget, we do believe they're items that we could take care of in this year's budget with funds that we have. So at the bottom of this area, while these items are not currently in the budget, the items in green, we believe we can do them this year and not have to build them into next year's budget. So the sum total of these items is $544,000, but if we move the green items into this year's budget and take care of them, the total is $439,000 for items not currently in the budget. So now we're going to move forward that since our last meeting, there's been conversations of things that are currently in the budget. And so the bottom of this slide actually shows items that are currently in the budget that we are here to talk about. The three items in green, you will see not only will I present them later, but they're in Mr. Clement's facilities budget. They are three items we need to occur boiler room repairs, a records room conversion, and some curtains in Lloyd Harbor. We do believe now that purchasing has been cut off, for the, cut off for the district as of March 1st, that we can purchase those this year. God bless you. Bless you. That we could purchase those this year and therefore remove them from the budget. And then we also um, bring to the board's attention uh, the assistance to the superintendent title that the board has um, wanted to consider. The sum of all these items that that could potentially be removed from the budget is $424,000. God bless, God bless you. you. Okay. So here again is um, our budget as we sit tonight. At our last meeting, one of the board trustees asked to take a closer look at the administration side of the budget and the increase in that one area. So the next 15 or so slides are related just to that one area. But I'm actually going to go quickly through them because I'm going to, there's stars next to certain areas that are the drivers for this 959,000. So I'm going to hang on the drivers and speak to them and I'll go quickly through the other slides. So the administration section of the budget is made up of the Board of Education, District Clerk, the annual budget vote and trustee election and central administration, which is made up of all of these items, superintendent, business, audit, purchasing, legal, human resources, public relations, all facilities operations, which includes operations, maintenance, and security, administrative technology, insurance, which is not employee benefits, it's insurance like our property and casualty insurance for our district and our buildings, association dues, and BOCES fees that we pay as a component district of BOCES. We actually pay our proportion of their admin and facility fees. So that gets passed down right to the component districts. So that's what makes up those, those codes. Um, and we're going to look at them in detail. So Board of Ed, District Clerk, and District Meeting, there really are no increases in these codes. So we're going to move fast through there. Same in the superintendent area, really no, no increase. Business operations actually have a decrease in its total operations related to retirements and replacement of staff at lower rates. 
Legal, I'm gonna hang on legal for a second. As we discussed, we have um, a projected increase in our legal costs related to ongoing CBA litigation. And that is represented here, $175,000 increase um, in our current budget. Personnel and HR has minor increases. Public relations has minor increases. Plant operations. This is our um, maintenance of our current buildings, which includes all of our custodial staff and other needs. So I'm hanging on two numbers here. It is an increase in salaries and an increase in electricity. I wanted to say that the salary increase when I get to the next slide um, is actually a decrease, and I'm gonna show it to you just quickly. It's a decrease of $2,000. I did a little, re I reallocated some salaries that should have been properly recorded in the right places. So we're gonna look at those in tandem. It's a $172,000 increase, and you look at the next slide quickly, the salaries are a $2,000 increase. The sum of those two salary lines in for the district is almost $3.5 million. So a $170,000 increase in $3.5 million salaries is just something to bring to your attention, but it's a large, it's a large amount, of, it's a large salary number. And the other item to note is our electricity increase. And as we've been speaking about, and the board adopted at their last meeting, a to use our capital reserve to put air conditioning throughout our buildings, which is wonderful, but that will result in additional electricity costs for the district. So we have two, two drivers of the electricity costs, really three. Rates are increasing about 3% is the projected rate increases. And we have a new wing on the high school, about 17,000 square feet, and we have new anticipated electricity district-wide. So that's driving that increase. The plant operations. I'm sorry, uh, wasn't the cost of wasn't the cost of the electricity to run the air conditioning included in the cost of the air conditioning? You mean in like, the use of the reserve? Yes. The use of the reserve is only to build, to, to build it. The ongoing electrical Didn't costs are paid out of the general fund. Like the electric was it, Yeah, well, I thought. No, that was to upgrade. I, just to upgrade. To upgrade right, the service panels. To upgrade the service okay. panels in the building. Yes, Lisa, okay. that, is what, that was what was included in there. The upgrade of the service panels needed. Okay, but it didn't. It wasn't including any of the electricity costs. No, and, and, and electricity no. costs are not a capitalized expense. The ongoing cost of electricity is a general fund item that we would build into the general fund. So that's the drivers here. And in our plant operations, you'll see that in the middle of the page, there's a hundred and seventy-seven thousand dollar increase and a ten thousand dollar increase. The increase in that line item is additional needs that we have in the district. The major and you'll actually notice on a prior slide we spoke about additional budget considerations. We're actually recommending to remove $170,000 from this line and do the boiler repairs in the current year budget. But right now that's not taken out of there. If the board is so inclined, it would reduce this line. But this is additional repairs that are needed across the district. And I don't want to interrupt you, but we're at 20 minutes. Okay, so. okay. let's go faster. Okay, and in security, this is just actual costs of our security staff and the increased use that we have. Equipment is Salto doors and uh, walkie-talkies. Oh, and here we have um, insurance is increasing about 17% across the district per NICER due to their CBA claims that they're dealing with. So here is the total increase, the $959,000 and the details in red. Okay, so a balanced budget. So we talk about a balanced budget and that's how we end our conversations usually when, we, when we're meeting. So balanced budget. On the left-hand side, we're actually going to not spend a lot of time here because this is assuming Governor Hochul's state aid proposal, which as of today, uh, we've received pretty much good news that that is not likely. So we're going to hang on the right side of this proposal right here. On this right side of the proposal, it assumes that we are continuing with the security booth that's in the current year's budget. And as such, and our current estimates of expenditures, we are, and sorry, Jill had to more, we are, um, we are at a position where $2.6 million in fund balance and reserves would be needed to close our budget position, and, um, and that's where we are, assuming a restoration of our hold harmless monies from the state. And the next slide is the same information. I'm just gonna go quickly on the right. It's really assuming that we do not move forward with the security booth and we repurpose those monies to CBA unanticipated costs. And that does have an impact. And on the right-hand side, that would be $3 million in fund balance and reserves to, um, uh, to address that, okay? 
So if you're looking at the presentation, if you're looking online, you're seeing a bunch of these long-range financial plan, from the financial outlooks. I want to just concentrate on, if you, if you have a copy, it's the fifth one. It's the first one that says state aid held harmless on the left-hand side. I'm going to concentrate in one place because I want to just make it clear that the State of the Union in Cold Spring Harbor is very strong. So I want to make sure that we understand that when we're done looking at this financial outlook. There's many versions of it because of many things we spoke about tonight. A, fine, you know, a security booth, not a security booth. $350,000 in the budget we're building for transfer to capital or not. The state making us held harmless or not. But they all have a similar outlook. So I'm, I'm hanging on this one. This one is the, this one is that we are moving forward with the security booth and we're building in $350,000 into next year's budget for, for hold harmless. And we're assuming that our state aid is held harmless. So at our last meeting, we saw that the pace of revenues and the pace of expenditures are not keeping up with each other. But this is where I really, I'm gonna show you, this is gonna come up. This is, I really wanna show you, while it affects our surplus and our deficit, I wanna concentrate here on these stars. Because while this is an outlook and it helps us build a current year budget, but just know that there are a lot of factors in each one of these lines that are changeable, as we're seeing right now. State aid is changing before our eyes. We just received a revised proposal for transportation that will change these numbers by the next time we meet. There are a lot of things changing. It's an outlook. So if we concentrate down below, right here, this is our fund balance and our reserves. We are in very strong position to end this year at a $16 million fund balance and reserves in 23-24 and potentially next year at 18 million, is a very strong position to be in. Even if our financial outlook and the truth of the current data we have is revenues aren't keeping up with expenditures, we have a lot of options here at Cold Spring Harbor that fund balance and reserves are gonna help us in years that are not now, years from now, make decisions that we can make um, knowing knowledge. And we're an educated community, so I like us to just know that we appreciate just knowing what the future looks like and the components, and we can advocate for revenue, expenditure growth changes, but I want us to concentrate on the fund balance and reserves line at the bottom because that is really the line that helps us ensure that our programs are stable and strong into the future. No matter what changes in these, it gives us opportunities to react to that well. Districts like you're seeing, like Amityville, that are unfortunately having in a, in a terrible position and they're cutting 43 or 47 staff members. If you really look back at their financials online, which I have done, they have been um, ignoring some facts for, for a couple of years and they don't have any fund balance and reserves left. So that's the takeaway. It's like we have a lot of fund balance and reserves to handle a lot of situations into the future. And I want that really to be the takeaway and the eight other versions of the long-range financial plan that are in here are just other scenarios we spoke about tonight. But, and, and so that's really where we're concluding tonight. And let me just get past these. And I think, oh, our next steps, next steps. Oh, we have another meeting now. Again, a change. See, everything changes from the long-range financial the outlook 25th. to the slide. The 25th, I should say. So we'll meet on Monday, the 25th, and we'll have more conversations. April 16th, we will adopt the budget and the tax levy. And on May 14th, we'll conduct our public hearing. And the 21st, we'll have our vote for our budget, our trustees, and our propositions. And that's it. Questions? Oh, no questions. Christine, no questions. I just wanted to say, though, thank you so much for showing us every variable that we asked for in the last meeting. We will save our questions for the end. But Great. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Up next is technology. technology. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this first slide is illustrating some of the things we did this year in 23-24. We upgraded our music lab at the junior senior high school where students compose digital music uh, in the class. Uh, Joe, oh. can you talk into the microphone? I'm oh, sorry. And later on, <laughs> and I tell everyone to, I'm sorry. Joe. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. I know. Awesome. And, and, and later on, you'll be, um, uh, we'll be surplusing those units that we took out uh, of the classroom uh, at the beginning of the year. 
We uh, put in the new te te technology into the STEAM lab, which we had a, a ribbon cutting at the beginning of the school year. Our business lab down in H18 has five promethean boards with furniture there, so each of the uh, uh, businesses that are put together has their own really personal space to run a business and hold meetings. And then all the technology, the new science wing, from switches to telephones to computers to Wi-Fi and the like, uh, were included uh, and purchased for this school year that we're, we're in right now. Uh, the current budget supports lots of things like our STEAM uh, collaboration, 3D printing, makerspace, robotics and the like, cybersecurity, which we spoke about at an earlier time where we have lots of cybersecurity to keep our students and sta uh, staff safe, including our data, due to research, one-to-one -one computing, so on and so forth. Uh, here is the budget summary. Uh, you can see BOCES in particular is the one that goes up. I try and move as much as I can into the BOCES code because we receive aid back from the state. Uh, this will probably change. I'm continuing to work on other items to move in there, particularly our uh, foreign language program, Wayside, which is $36,000. So if we could get that to be purchased by BOCES, uh, we would get aid back from the state there. Uh, the other big items which I could th that are uh, BOCES, we're looking to move to Parent Square, which is a different communication program, or, or Second Step SEL program, or a CyberNut uh, phishing campaign. Uh, we're enhancing our security of Google, our Xerox and Konica leases are moved into the tech budget this year. Uh, security camera maintenance, now that we have them, there's a maintenance contract that goes with that. And the big project is replacing our, our switches. There are 40 of them across the district. This is the stuff you never see that everything runs on the backbone. They will be eight years old uh, this summer, and this is to replace them and to have them installed. Uh, and we're also looking for down the road, either next year or the following year, looking to replace the fiber that's inside the district uh, that connects all the switches uh, from, for the classrooms. Right now it's one gigabit of information flowing to move to 10. This would well, that would be able to do that. We already did that with the switches for the new science wing in planning for the future. And also the Chromebooks. We buy Chromebooks for fourth, seventh, and 10th graders. These are just some of the things that the budget supports. I know move quickly is the mantra. Uh, <laughs> Upgrade, SEL, library resources, color printing. As you notice, everything is in color. Color is green and it's expensive. So we spend a lot more money on printing every year, but it makes such a difference not only here, but particularly in the classrooms. Uh, we have printers in pretty much every, well actually every classroom at the elementary level and across uh, the district at the secondary level and color is really making a huge difference. Uh, as we said, uh, cybersecurity, Maybe a visitor check-in program, our door lock system, our badges, enhanced communication, our internet, our Wi-Fi. We will be updating our school website. Uh, we are kind of finalizing which of the templates we're going to use. This uh, uh, supports coding, our hackathons, uh, copiers, creativity. Everything we do runs on our network. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Dr. Schimpf, I think you're up again. Lucky you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you. All right, so I'm going to try to be brief but thorough. So some points of pride that I just wanted to highlight, um, starting in Cold Spring Harbor, parent partnership with SEPTO has been a lifesaver for me in regard to just generating ideas, coordinating events, and just, you know, troubleshooting. In regard to staff development, as I shared, we have an outstanding special education staff. We did give elementary and secondary surveys, and they did indicate that they would like more professional development. This year, at the secondary level, we were really focusing on reading strategies, and at the elementary school level, we are piloting a curriculum and instructional resources for our ABA special class on functional academics. Lastly, mental health 
uh, mental health initiatives by our PPS staff, which is made up of my budget, which includes social workers and school psychologists, as well as our ENL teachers. Um, we did roll out Second Step, as you heard, um, and our school psychologists have been integral with the collaboration of the PE and Health Department. And in regard to Cold Spring Harbor Unites, uh, our school psychologists have been in partnership with Goose Hill. As a matter of fact, this Friday, they're going to be doing a global play event um, where our high school uh, students will be working with our Goose Hill students. So just looking at the current budget, I just laid out for you. I'm not going to go over point by point. These are all of our current program offerings. All of the current offerings will be included in the budget. Um, so as you can see, um, it's a full continuum. It does not include the ICT. It includes also our PPS staff and our added district placements. So looking at our budget, as you can see, I do have some red arrows, so please do not be concerned. I know that it's kind of scary sometimes. Um, so I did look at this budget very carefully, and I did look at over a four-year period just to see where our needs are and to be uh, cost efficient as well as trying to put funds where is needed. Um, so just some highlights in regard to equipment, you will see an increase there based upon the staff survey. There is a need of just looking at more and more assisted technology, and we will be piloting some scanning pens for students with dyslexia. So that's one area. And we are also equipping more of our general education classrooms with FM systems. Looking at uh, other professional tech services, this is where all of our um, contracted providers, our district of location expenses are. There is a decrease that I am recommending uh, based upon what the current expenditures are. And I also did include contingencies as placeholders as well uh, as things arise. Tuition, we do have a slight increase based upon rates, tuition <coughs> rates. However, we do have a decrease next year in regard to the number of added district students that we have. So we are, we are projecting next year 10, and I do have some placeholders as well, depending on CSE recommendations. Other than that, if you look at the last one with the uh, red arrow, special education, we're looking at a reduction of $139,064. For PPS, uh, which again, makes up of our ENL teachers. We did put a lot of investments this year in regard to translation services, so I would like to thank Joe for that. They're very excited. Um, we are looking at a reduction of 3,300, so the total <laughs> reduction for the special services budget, not including any proposals, is minus 142,364. Keeping in mind any excess cost uh, is being utilized with 611 and 619 grants. As well as for ENL, we also have the Title III BOCES Consortium that we're utilizing. So, looking at our proposed budget supports, our budget does include the 612 special classroom at Westside, so the students will be moving up. This also includes, and it's an increase because we are maintaining that same program at Goose Hill. Um, I've had communications with those families moving up, and they're very supportive of the district's commitment of servicing all children. These programs really serve students with developmental disabilities. In regard to the secondary level, just a highlight of guided study. We've had had guided study in the past. We are expanding to 11th grade based upon some need, as well as really redesigning it. Um, our vision is really looking at it as a ICT skills lab class that would have a consistency of a teacher um, that students would have that pull-out service if they require pre-teaching, reteaching, not just a resource room. So we are offering guided study every day and every other day. Added district placements again, everything is included with the 10 plus placeholders, and then continuing all current placements for our students. Questions? We're going to do questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much. Buildings and grounds, Mr. Clements. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Try that again. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you. Hi. So I'm going to take you through. I'm going to try to be brief but thorough. So some of our current budget supports, as you can see on the screen, um, we did some great things for maintenance and grounds this year. The addition of two vehicles that are very important to our operation, a pickup truck with a plow and also a sport utility or a, a vehicle, a utility vehicle stationed or to be stationed mostly at the high school for not just what you see pictured in, in snow, but also for year round use for all of our events and sporting. Um, events and all the uh, other activities that we have at a very busy building in Goose Hill. So the renovation of room 16 where we took down the ceiling and all the lights and we're able to replace it with a much cleaner look. LED lighting uh, saves money on our electric consumption. We're also able to purchase these items for about half price from our suppliers at a um, pre-discounted price. We don't have to lay out the money. We are able to get it at almost half of uh, the retail price through PSCNG rebates. Also in there is the courtyard doors that are going to be installed hopefully late spring. Lead times are a little difficult right now, but uh, shop drawings have been approved and we are going to upgrade the doors that you see there with doors that match uh, what we are putting in around the district and what's consistent uh, to the building. It'll have the uh, new swipe access and uh, new panic hardware in there and just be a, a cleaner look, also more efficient. Um, over at West Side, you can see the picture of the uh, pitted uh, window panels and uh, that are in need of repair and replacement. That is also in the works right now. It should be completed towards the end of the school year. Um, also just completed over the last recess uh, was new lighting in the common areas and all of the hallways at the West Side, again, with the LED lighting. That was another project that uh, changed the look of the building, also helped us uh, uh, save money on our electric and we were able to do this with in-house labor and also at a, a pretty uh, cheap price. Over to Lloyd Harbor, I just got word actually this week that the slide has been received and we are scheduling that installation and you can see also that the uh, music band room was updated with new carpet. Uh, that was something that didn't change the acoustic value or properties to the room and it gave it just a much cleaner look and also uh, carpet as it gets old sometimes has the as it breaks down has a tendency to maintain or retain odors and uh, be harder to clean and maintain. There we go. Also last but not least at the high school we have uh, the addition or the replacement of the ADA compliant ramp in the senior commons, which used to be a metal ramp that was uh, more of a, a temporary structure that stuck around for a while. This is a concrete or mason ramp that is, as I said, ADA compliant, and it has a uh, rubber flooring to it. It also, as you can see, the handrails have the uh, wings extended on them, and so it's in full compliance. It's received positive feedback from uh, the students over at the high school. I've, I've seen, uh, you know, some and people talking about it positively and heard from the staff, so that's always great to see that we can impact the students that way. The junior high boiler room electrical panel that is in progress, we are at a point where some of our electrical components are older, we can no longer replace breakers, so for the safe operation of our boiler rooms and equipment and for the staff and people working in the rooms, we have to replace panels. That is. Um, should be done hopefully in the spring. We're still waiting a little bit uh, on the lead time for those products. Uh, one of the other hits with the custodial staff is the ride-on machine. Uh, we were able to add, I think, a very good piece of equipment to our arsenal over there. These are things that we usually have to replace every few years. It's a machine that we spent some time and uh, researched to get a piece of equipment that was very durable and, and beneficial to the staff. I believe in this area, Christine went through this and explained the um, electrical portion of this and and how that was, um, you know, impacted the budget and, and all the thoughts behind that. With um, this is the CPI. This is where we got our three percent increase. Also explained by Christine. Should be 
onto the portion with the increase, the $177,000 increase. And that's where I just want to put a little bit of detail into this. That involves components in the boiler rooms at Lloyd Harbor and West Side. They are condensate tanks that have been repaired over the years. We've reached the point where we are at replacement. Um, we have two tanks at Lloyd Harbor, one at West Side, and we also have um, a, a sump pump and some of the drainage over at West Side that's all part of that uh, mechanical package that needs to be replaced. As I said, they were repaired for years, and we are at the point where putting money into replacement is more economical and, and the better option for us. Those projects, just to note, are best served when we do them after heat season. So we really have from late spring until just about when school starts. It's our ideal window to do those. We don't have to worry about generating heat. We also don't have occupants in the building. It makes it much easier to do those projects. On this side, um, on to the security. Oh, did I go forward? Not yet. There we go. Okay. We talked about this. I, I believe uh, Christine covered this por portion also. And that brings us to some of the items in this year's budget. So district-wide, I won't take you through that, but these are ongoing initiatives that we want to support each year, wood floor refinishing, maintaining our asphalt and concrete. We do a lot of repair work after a long season of winter or just a change in temperatures. These are things that we need to do spot repairs on. And, and, and that's something that, that is built in each year for us to do. In Goose Hill, we've identified that we need to do some exterior lighting, both existing and additional to the building. Lloyd Harbor, I mentioned the condensate tanks and the mechanical repairs that need to get done throughout the building. There's also the front door entrance area that leads to a boiler room, the front door when you walk in, and also the two doors that lead down into the boiler and mechanical areas should be replaced, or in need of a replacement, I should say. West side, I mentioned the mechanical repairs and the condensate tank over there. At the junior senior high school, there are doors, interior doors that need to be replaced, upgraded to the doors with the Salto swipe and electronic access that is consistent throughout most of the building. The security initiatives we discussed with staffing and the additional um, projects with that. As far as the, uh, on the equipment side, this, uh, the, the replacement of custodial equipment really centers around us uh, almost being on a three to five year plan with a lot of our equipment. It receives high use, everything from vacuums and floor scrubbers and carpet cleaners just need to be replaced on a, a continual basis. And going through on the, the grounds equipment, these are just other items that are, their expense is over $500 and they're, they're items that are plow parts, plows, uh, mowers, blowers, and all different items that need to be built in here because again, like the custodial equipment, they do give us a shelf life of anywhere from three to five years as much as we try to maintain them due to their heavy use. And I also have in here the replacement of AC units. We do have current window units in throughout the district in many locations. They also cannot be repaired. They're usually best served by replacing uh, window units. And again, we are three to five years on those in some cases, maybe a little bit longer depending on use. And last on here is the replacement of HVAC parts and equipment. These are items that are important to be in this part of the budget because it gives us the ability to have our staff purchase parts and put them in so we do not have to be in a position where we go out to have a contractor not only mark those items up, but then charge us labor. So it's important to have uh, those items in there, which I can tell you this year we had a challenging year and the staff did a great job meeting those challenges by, by doing a lot of work for us that we didn't have to put out to contractors. Thank you. Thank you, thanks very okay. much. Thank you very much, and uh, 
like everyone else has said, I will do my very best to keep this brief. You know, I can love to talk about athletics and Cold Spring Harbor, so. But these are just, uh, you know, some, the points of pride, which obviously everybody can read, and we've had another very successful athletic school year. Um, and that also will lead into how the budget is planned, um, because I do have to take into consideration what I might expect will happen next year with, and it, again, it's thinking ahead, knowing what is returning amongst our athletes and players. But we really have seen such tremendous success here. And again, I always say this, it's not just about athletics. We are a student athletes and every team again are uh, scholar athletes through New York State. So here is a little bit of the budget summary. And to go over it a little bit, and then I will link into uh, some of um, Christine Costa's uh, slides to explain. So the budget was built with everything that we currently have in it, with some increases that are necessary, where you see like with coaching salaries and official salaries, that's part of the uh, teacher's contract. It's also part of the projection of one time when you see an increase, that is the projection mostly at the high school level for our varsity teams. I have to project what teams might make the playoffs and go into postseason. And I, I'm very proud to say that so far, this particular year, we have not had a team not qualify for postseason play. And then you also have to take into consideration how far they go. So like last year, I would not have necessarily expected, and I'm gonna talk about like the basketball programs for a second. We became what's called a classification class A school. That is built off our beds numbers. I now currently know that we are gonna be a class B school next year. So I have to bring that to the forefront that there is a real chance that we're gonna go very far in a lot of sports. Because I also take the graduation rate of our seniors the athletes that are juniors, sophomores coming up. A lot of these teams that I'm only gonna use the example of the winter. We had a state champion in wrestling. He's only a junior. We had five kids go to the states. Now, only one graduated. The basketball team, we only graduated a total of four. That's boys and girls. In track, where you saw in points of pride, we had all, a bunch of students go to nationals, go to states, they're all returning. So the, I'm going to expect the same, tennis is included. I mean, I can go through every sport. That's not, I don't think, the point here. But so that's I where that number comes from. Like, that's what this is. <laughs> then you have the equipment budget, which has things in it that must be replaced, uh, also for safety reasons, and things that are mandated by the NFHS. You will see when we move, um, for example, in boys and girls lacrosse, we must purchase portable shock locks. We don't have them on our scoreboards now. Next spring in 2025, it is an abs it's a must. All uh, high schools in New York are playing with the shot clock at the varsity and JV level. Obviously our laundry and cleaning, you know, that's just cleaning all of the equipment, contractual expenses, athletic memberships, and the other ones are also part of things like services from BOCES. That's the number of teams we have, it's the officials, so those are like kind of set numbers. I don't have much control over those. Our memberships are also part of uh, championships, awards, invitationals that we get invited to, regattas and crew. All those things are built into that. When we swim at the Y, what we currently pay for ice hockey, which I will get to in a little bit, currently pay for crew, the lease at Eagle Dock, and so on and so forth. The general supplies component, which you'll see, is replacement of uniforms, balls, tennis balls, basketball, soccer balls, things that have to come in every year. I run everything on a five-year cycle with uniforms, unless there's something really drastic. And we're now at that point where I'm replacing our junior high uniforms. They were kind of last. We worked from varsity on down. This shows the number of coaches we have, the number of participants that we have. This fluctuates from year to year, but I can tell you currently right now, we just started the spring at the high school. We have 310 kids in the high school, nine through 12, registered for spring sports, and 191 at the junior high. We're almost over 82% of our student population are participating in something. 
I have I do this for everything, for all of the uh, levels, and obviously the seasons. And it, I put some notes in there to show some of the success. This is something I want to mention about where you see where it says like three teams. There are a lot of times when that would fluctuate. Um, it's in the budget for that, but based upon the numbers. And what will lead me to when I talk about, and I know this will probably come up more on March 25th, but I, I have recommendations regarding some of the additionals that were shown in uh, Christine Costa's uh, slides, how to increase for ice hockey, increase for crew, and uh, why flag football came about. Students came to me, finally, flag football has been, now it's in its in third year. 26 schools in Nassau County out of the 57 participate in flag football. It is a sanctioned sport by NISFA with a state championship. I held off because it didn't get too much traction. This year I got traction. Emails from parents, students came to see me, and that leads me to why I left it on this slide. When we created uh, cheer as a sport and junior high cheer, one of my potential recommendations was Maybe it would knock the junior high volleyball program from three teams to two teams. This way, you know, things would balance out. Why I don't have a crystal ball, I was wrong. We actually can ha we have them all. We had 16 kids on each volleyball team. So it might be pulling students from different areas. So like when you have a roster of 23 in a sport where really it only needs 15, maybe they're transitioning into that other sport. But I do my best with data, and I have it completed on a five-year plan that I can present on how that works with our student athletes. And it's the same thing for every sport here. These are some of the events that we host. Most, a lot of them do not have a real cost to the school district. Uh, some do. Um, when there's a county event, uh, that's section. We pay for security. Um, but this section actually pays some of the people that work the event and some of the times if you saw yellow jackets here, things of that nature. These are just some of them like, but then you see the cheerleading competition, Battle at the Harbor, uh, those, th those are part of our regular league schedule. We've had them for the last, you know, even before I got here, but the last uh, 11 years. The next thing, part of the budget, was also the supervisions. I explain how many people I put on each event, what we cover. I'm going to just leave it at this. Athletics is under scrutiny all the time. And I can be very proud to say that we do not have any problems in Cold Spring Harbor athletics, home or away. I am sure you've all seen the news. I don't need to talk about the two school districts, things that went on. I don't ever want to see that happen here. And every single person that I assign has a role. Officials, the other team, the, the fans, the other team's fans, so, so on and so forth. There's, everyone has a job when they are. And then we also have a lot of rivalries, so sometimes I do increase that, and I have that on a spreadsheet as well. Same thing with the junior high. And the proposed budget, uh, what it would support, obviously the continued improvement of our facilities, the three- to five-year rotation of uniforms, which I discussed. There are things that also... Um, always have to be part of the budget. Helmets, which obviously football and lacrosse, which we have to, we give out, they go out to be reconditioned, shoulder pads also. There are times when we'll send out 110 football helmets. Based upon how they were used in the season and their life expectancy, I might only get 65 back and they'll be rejected. So I have to plan for that as well. So I never allow them to go further than five years without kind of replenishing them naturally. Obviously, we have our cameras that we've installed, and we're going to add to that. Um, we, are, we have one currently in the works now that we're working to get uh, on the upper turf. We just have to have once the Wi-Fi is installed and the pole. But I would, I, the new gym, which has multiple sports, needs the camera, and that's part of next year's budget. Then, and we, that's a way to live stream the games. And I have actually numbers on that and how many people have seen. Um, watch those games that are here in the field house, in the new gym, soon to be the upper turf, lower turf. And if everything works out well, Mr. Monastero will get baseball and softball going as well with the beautiful new fields that our kids are on uh, the last two days because the weather's been fantastic. <laughs> 
and like I said before, expectation of championship banners. And, I, and in athletics, I think it's pretty fair to say that I have to reserve money for unexpected things, um, a scoreboard breaking, panel, uh, score panels breaking, things of that nature. So these are just some of the pictures of some of the things. And we already talked about the windscreens that we hopefully may be able to purchase with this year's budget. That video score table is the second half of the one that's already been purchased. So I only purchased the first half last year. This is the second half. It actually will serve two purposes. It combines together, so you'll have one massive one, let's say something in the field house, but also when we have field house basketball, wrestling going on in a new gym, it separates and both gyms can have it. Uh, we must replace the soccer goals. I have not replaced soccer goals in about five years, and uh, there are field uh, goals on the upper turf that are must go. Um, the five-man sled in football, also the other one's rusting, it's not safe for the kids. Those are the portable shot clocks that we need to get, and we need to have one on each end zone, so it's a total of four. These are just some of the wonderful things our kids uh, um, have done. Of course, our, scholar, our uh, athletes that go on to continue. And to add to something, I want to make sure it was very clear. In this budget, what we normally currently cover for the three things that were on that additional things for the board to consider is still there. So ice hockey, it's still the league fees that we naturally cover. It's still the uniforms, it's still the coaches, all of that. With the three teams that we have, I have recommendations and options for the board to consider to increase some of the funding. So that money that you saw there would be in addition to what's already currently in the budget. Crew is the same thing. So the Eagle Doc lease fee is already in my budget, the uniforms, the coaches, and so on. It might be time, though, to look at a new way to, design, uh, to look at crew here. Um, we do have a boathouse. I do look at the numbers of the kids that are um, rowing in the fall and the spring. That does, I'm not coming to you not to support crew and financially support it. It could be just a different way for us to look at it. And then flag football would be one team in the high school. And one of my biggest things when the kids came to me was I had, they made, big, made a list. I had to make sure what they played in the spring. Okay, and also I wanted to make sure that it wasn't a list of seniors only. They graduated and no one's there to fill in. So this was a real, a, a lot of kids from all ages, junior high all the way through the high school. And I will have recommendations of what I think the board should consider and wish to move forward with. Um, and I'm assuming that might take place more on March 25th due to the time. I would think so, too. Thank you so much, Mr. Bungino, for that presentation. And thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you should know, Mr. Bungino, that I've never seen such a flurry of emails as we saw in the last 24 hours in support of athletics and new athletics being added in. So. When you say that you added cheerleading, thinking that you might get a drop off somewhere else, I think you've just got so many kids who are dying to play sports. So thank you. I, I like that. You know how I feel about kids. Great. Thanks so much. All right. Um, we are now going to move on to committee reports. So um, Bill, are you going to kick us off? Yes. Um, so the policy committee met on Thursday. Um, we, we're trying to tackle, as I've mentioned before, a number of things that are either legacy things that we have to deal with that are routine, as well as other things that are being brought up. Um, we, we are very committed to making sure we're not, as a policy committee, driving things on our own, but bringing things back here to make sure we get input of the whole board. We don't want to work on something unless, um, unless everybody agrees. So. We're, we worked a little bit on updating the sexual harassment policy. There's nothing really to report there. Um, we're also uh, looking at a personal, the personal electronic devices policy. Um, I know people have suggested we should review that to make sure um, we have the right policy in place in terms of uh, students using electronic devices. Um, and also there's um, a voting policy change where um, Early voting is mandated by New York, and we have to see how that fits with absentee ballots and other things, and we're waiting for more information on that. We do have um, two items, and uh, I want to point out these are not votable items. This is just 
a, a head nod or no, um, wanting to know if you want more pursuit of this from the policy committee. One is um, deals with bidding for contract and services. Um, there's uh, two suggestions. One is do we, we do have a bidding policy. Um, I know there were a lot of questions in prior meetings. Uh, and so the question is, should we look at our overall um, bidding procedures and policies to make sure they're up to date and doing what we want them to do? And that would include looking at specialized services such as auditor, legal, um, architect, other things like that. So um, the second is we, um, we looked at the grading policy coming off of uh, Mr. Dambuski's presentation at the last meeting. Um, the grading policy does not, and, and um, that was, we had a conversation about um, including region scores. Uh, the, the grading policy does not um, give any specifics about how grading is to be done. It's left to the teacher, to the district. It talks about things about consistency. So right now, there's no board action required. If people feel that uh, the policy committee should go back and look at making a recommendation around um, authorizing a change or mandating a change, we could do that. But right now, it's, um, it's more of left to the administration to figure out how grading gets done. So um, those two items would take some time, and we just need to sort of know if you want us to follow in on either of them. It doesn't mean we'll do, change anything. It just right. Well, I would I would like you to look at the bidding policy. I think it's important to think about you know when when we're um, putting out an RFP for the auditor, or the architect, and legal, and whether that's done on a cycle or not. It would be helpful to just look at it. Okay. I I agree. I think it's best practice to continue to examine that for. Okay. Um, just as we examine other policies. I have a question about the um, grading policy as it pertains to the, the presentation we had. I keep saying last week, but it was like a couple of weeks ago. It feels like yesterday, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, and uh, the question is, since the policy doesn't really directly address that, is that something that needs to be re-looked at or if there's a recommendation of the board to make an exception as far as regions go, is that something that is separate from the policy? That's my question, I guess. Maybe is that for policy to discuss? Is that for the board to discuss? Is that? Are you talking about the whole line? Yeah. I'm just I'm I'm curious. I, the, I re reread the policy. It didn't seem to really it does specifically it. say that. And I don't think anyone's intention is to take all the grading Right, I, I oversee mean, gr grading policy. It could at be the a school. slippery slope right. where we yeah. first open it up about uh, regents, or then talk about AP grading. Right. Like, so I, I, I think we're asking: Do you want to go down that path, or you could do it? I guess as a, a motion at the board, the full board. But I think it really is embedded in a policy, and we have a process on policy to, you know, have the first read, the second read. So. I, we really ask you, you guys. Should I, I guess us my feeling is, as a board, we should all sit and look at the policy together, then, and yeah. decide on that one. Because I don't think we have enough information to do like a head nod yes. vote right now. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay, so maybe what I'll put I could the policy in Friday notes for you to take a look at. Great. Okay. Yeah. And then we just we can have some clarification on what we what we how we think we'd handle that. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry for the lengthy. <laughs> you were, what are we, what was everyone saying that I loved? Brief um, but thorough. Brief but thorough. I love it. I'm going to try to live my life that way. Now I'm such a blab. Okay. Um, who, what other committees met since um, the last meeting? Professional development met. Great. So I'm going to be super brief. I don't know how thorough. We discussed the survey that uh, of past uh, professional development um, from our teachers, and we broke out into small groups, and we went into a discussion about what future PD could be offered in view of those results. Thank you. Did any other committees meet? No. Okay. Thank you both for your presentation. Um, we are going to continue to our first audience to visitors.
the Cold Spring Harbor Board of Education and Administration welcome your attendance at board meetings. Audience to the public affords residents an opportunity to address the Board of Education on both agenda and non-agenda items. Each resident is allowed to speak for three minutes. This is not the forum to discuss student or staff specific issues. Please contact the district separately on these matters. Is there a list or I guess if anyone is interested in coming up, please come on up to the, to the podium and um, introduce yourself. Name and address. Sure, please. hi, I'm Joe Weinberg. My address is 4 Brandy Road. Uh, I have a daughter, Joey, in kindergarten here. Uh, so, dear board members and also uh, people within our community, I respectfully implore you to adopt the integrated code teaching model at the elementary level within Cold Spring Harbor. I'm an elementary ICT teacher myself in a neighboring district, and I know firsthand the many benefits of this type of classroom. As a special education teacher in this setting, my co-teachers and I have witnessed and facilitated so many powerful learning experiences for children. Some examples include, but are most definitely not limited to, kids rotating through stations in heterogeneous groupings to chart debated ideas, watch videos, analyze maps, and draw conclusions from ancient civilization artifacts with two hands-on instructors facilitating the, lesson, the learning all in one lesson. Neurotypical students pairing with neurodivergent learners to create classroom gadgets such as pencil vending machines and safety scissor harnesses providing daily in-classroom multi-sensory programs to students, such as Orton Gillingham, Quick Reads and Level Literacy Intervention in Reading and Math, Cloud Nine, Touch Math, and Number Waltz, to name a few. This model would not only benefit students with individualized education plans, but also provide scaffolded support to striving learners within our community, as well as enrichment to the gifted students. Put simply, every single child benefits. It fosters collaboration among staff members and most importantly, students. It provides ongoing opportunities for students to learn about and accept the diverse needs of others. In this type of classroom, teachers are encouraged to select from six models that are used flexibly and purposefully for the sole purpose of meeting the needs of all learners within the classroom. What better way to support the Cold Spring Harbor community than to provide our children with an opportunity to be part of a classroom environment that at its core reduces a student to teacher ratio and aims to bridge the gap among students with varying learning needs. Inclusive general education classrooms like the ICT foster tolerance and understanding among typically developing students while supporting neurodivergent learners and students with disabilities to practice and develop social skills necessary for building relationships. As someone who has built her career working in an ICT classroom as a special education teacher, I firmly believe that we need to adopt this model in Cold Spring Harbor for our elementary school students because it will provide our community's children with such great positive, memorable learning experiences for every single type of learner. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else? Hello. Good evening, Good evening members of the board. Uh, my name is Chris Reed. I've had two of my children already graduate from Cold Spring Harbor, and I currently have a um, ninth grader at the high school. Um, I'm here to voice and express my uh, support for adding ice hockey to the uh, athletic program budget. Um, over the years, um, being a resident of the community, I've been really pleased to see the hockey program grow. Um, there's a very dedicated coaching staff. They oversee three teams, one at the uh, junior high level, the JV level, and the varsity level. They're doing a phenomenal job. Um, but despite that, it is still just a club program. Um, there are many additional resources the hockey club needs, both financial, of course, and non-financial. So <clears throat> I think adding uh, the sport uh, to the budget will uh, be great for the program and, and see it take the next step and grow further. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Carrie Albers, and I'd like, I'd like to start out by thanking the board for all your hard work and all you do to support the best interest of the children of our district. There are a couple of things that I'd like to discuss today. First is the topic of how the region should be weighted. We had a survey come out, and the results clearly showed that the majority of the parents of our district were in favor of the whole harmless policy. So why is it that the administration isn't respecting our wishes, the wishes of the parents. It's my understanding that they're still pushing a 12% weight. Why did they even bother sending out a survey if they weren't going to consider the results? The proposed 12% isn't helping the situation at all. If anything, it's hurting those students that do well on the exams by not giving them the 20% weight, such as the policy does now. I'd like to understand the administration's rationale for not giving our children the best possible opportunity for success. I feel like I must be missing something. Please specifically explain why we're putting our students at a disadvantage to those of other districts, such as Roslyn, Jericho, et cetera. If the argument is that students won't put forth effort if they know that no impact is on their grade, I say, how's that different from the current AP final exam policy? If anything, students taking both exams will try harder to score well on the regents because it will ultimately show up on their transcript. The AP will not. Where is the congruency in this logic? Per perhaps a meaningful compromise and solution to the issue would be considering a research paper or final project-based approach. My son's business class currently uses such a model. This format not only showcases the student's understanding and application of material taught, but allows for real-life implementation of business concepts. These applied skills are far more revealing of the mastery of subject matter when compared to final exams which is nothing more than a, a regurgitation of memorized facts. My son's class just completed a high-level research project where he had to analyze financial statements for different companies and analyze their leverage, profitability, and their investment potential. How can there be a more meaningful assessment than that? That goes on to my second point. Why are college-level business classes not receiving weighted grades? The coursework that's being completed in these college level is that of what I did as a financial analyst in my profession. It doesn't make sense that a ninth grade honors class is getting waiting while a college level class is not. Lastly, I'd like to voice my support of including ice hockey, flag football, and crew in the athletics budget for the coming years. To wrap up, I commend the Board of Education for all your efforts, and I ask that you consider the, the policy of how the Regents is weighted and respect what the parents of the district are asking you by Im implementing the hold harmless policy. Thank, Thank you. you. Are you coming up, Mr. Hodgendreas? Hello, my name is Chris Hodgendreas. Uh, address is 1592 Laurel Hollow Road. I just had a quick comment to make about the uh, adding the um, proposed sports to the budget. And that in regards to specifically with crew. Um, crew is a different sport than a lot of the other team sports, and different is good. A lot of kids, um, I think athletics is ultra important for all the kids. Uh, and. Uh, Crew really brings a lot of kids together that aren't into team sports or, or other sports. And supporting it really uh, helps. It's, a, it's an expensive endeavor. My son went through it, and I'm very grateful for it because before crew, before he found crew, he tried all different sports, and nothing was really working out. Eventually, when he found crew, he loved it and went on to become a D1 athlete as a freshman in college right now. And my wife and I are very grateful that he, uh, he, he found crew, and I really think um, supporting it stronger is going to help, as well as the other sports that are uh, up for additional funding. So 
I thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. We will now move on to minutes approval. I have to switch back to my <coughs> script. Hold on. Um, Just getting started. Good night, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs> We now move on to approval of minutes. February 27th, uh, minutes, all present. May I have a first? Bill, second, Lisa. Any questions? All in favor? All right, we now move on to personnel recommendations of the superintendent. We will take all leaves, resignations, and appointments, and personnel contracts on pages one through eight as a slate. May I have a first? Lisa, second. Heather, any questions? No, uh, is Mr. Huntsman here? No? Okay. I was just gonna say, you know, thank you for your service. We see your resignation is on here, right? He left, he had to leave, he okay. just sent a text. And we have one walk-on resolution, um, which is page eight, Number four, two, would that be correct, Jack? Yes. Number two. Either that we can make it five. Oh, number five. Okay. All right, which I, I will read separately, is that? And, and the resolution is just to add that item to the agenda. Okay, so Perfect. may I take a motion to add a, this item, resolution to the agenda? Yes, Kate, second. Bruce, any questions? Yes. Um, shall I read it? Yeah. Okay. Be it hereby resolved that the Board of Education of the Cold Spring Harbor Central School District approves the terms and conditions of a settlement agreement and a general release concerning a member of the staff identified in confidential attachment A. Be it further resolved that the Board accepts the resignation of said employee named in confidential attachment A. Be it further resolved that the board authorizes the president of the board to execute said settlement agreement and general release on the board's behalf. Somebody needs to move, move it and second. May I have a first? Kate, second. Bill, questions? All in favor? Thank you. Okay, we will now take business recommendations. We will take items one through three on pages eight and nine as a slate. These include budget transfers, health service contract, and a claims, and claims auditor's report. May I have a first? Lisa, second, Bill, any questions? All in favor? We will now move on to additional business matters, number four on pages nine and 10 as a slate. These include contracts with tour companies, coach bus companies, and vendors for international night at the junior senior high school. May I have a first? Kate, may I have a second? Heather, any questions? I just, I just have a yeah. very quick question, and you don't have to answer now, Christine. Are all these contracts standard they look pretty standard, but when I read them, I'm, I just don't know if people make changes or have their own. No, they come directly from our attorneys, these contracts. Okay. okay. So we use there the are some one. template yeah. ones that we can use, you know, for the same type of service or related service provider, but when things like International Night presented and we had no contracts, they got involved, drafted the contract that went to the vendors. Great. Thank you. All right. All in favor? Thank you. Uh, we move to special education reports one and two on page 10 as a slate. These include contracts with providers and CSE, CPSE approvals. May I have a first? Kate, a second. Lisa, any questions? All in favor? 
We now move to other matters, number one to number three on pages 10 to 11 as a slate. These include overnight field trips, certification of lead evaluators, and disposal of e-waste equipment. May I have a first? Lisa, may I have a second? Bruce, any questions? Okay. All in favor? All in favor. Thank you. We now move to a second reading and adoption of policy 9520.60 on page 11. Policy on rights of employees to express bre breast milk in the workplace. We will vote to waive a full reading of this policy and adopt. May I have a first? Bill, may I have a second? Kate, any discussion, questions? All in favor? Thank you. This agenda includes financial reports on page 11, and these reports are for informal purposes. No vote is necessary. If needed, Mrs. Costa will answer any questions from the Board of Education and public. Feel free to call her in her office. OK. We are now on to there's a second audience to visitors in here. It's just in the wrong order. The audience is first and then the discussion items, okay? Okay, so anyone else in the audience for a second audience to visitors? Oh, Mr. Larson? No? Okay. <laughs> okay, sometimes you come up. All right. Um, and uh, now this is the discussion section of our agenda. We will have agenda discussion on the following. Cybersecurity, campaign materials, transfer to capital, and regents review. So let's start with cybersecurity. Any discussion? Should we say that we had a presentation yeah. on cybersecurity? Sure. Am I but it was yes. Yeah, so we um, shared uh, some information with the Board of Education that was confidential um, related to the safety and security of our district in this regard. Um, so there is certain information though that you cannot share based on that presentation. And um, this really uh, was something that came up should the board wish to do an audit of our cybersecurity and again Christine mentioned it as part of the slide but would this be something that you'd want to add um, or based on the information that was provided that again is confidential would that be are you comfortable with the procedures and practices that are currently in place right so <coughs> I had originally I sorry I blanked out for a it's moment okay. so uh, <laughs> I, had, I had originally asked to consider this and um, I, I think uh, from my perspective, trying to understand a little bit more, which we were able to do. Uh, it is sensitive and security related. That's why it's not in public. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable leaving it up. To, we asked Mr. Monastero if he had budget needs for the budget and to express those. So I'm comfortable if he's, if he's uh, needs anything, he can ask us if, if there's not a, currently a budget item for audit. So I, I agree with that. I think. Are we're very secure. You're very thorough. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then the next item is campaign materials, and that is, um, I guess, time sensitive because the campaign is coming up, and um, the question is about language in the campaign materials, um, which came up in last year's election cycle, right, related to use of school logos and um, whether or not to include that in this year's um, brochure. So um, would anyone like to kick us off? Do you want me to kick Can it off? I, Christine, I, I don't have that language in front of me that's proposed. Do you, do you mind reading what we're proposing to put in the campaign materials? I have to run and get it, but I have no okay. problem. Want me to run and get it? And yeah, because that's to the next item. So this, like when we say campaign, these are for the candidates that are running for election. We put together a packet of materials for them, and this would be included within that packet if the board so choose. So I can pull it up oh. if you give me a minute. Okay, I probably can too. I don't care about the others. Talk amongst yourselves. Do something else. <laughs> so... 
Do you want to wait, Tammy, for the reading no, of go that? Ahead, Bill. So right. let me just tee up the issue. Um, I, I didn't feel passionate about this, but I think it's something we do have to resolve. So as a recent candidate last year, um, there, was, there was a discussion around use of logos. Um, my understanding is, um, in general, school districts uh, view the use of a school logo as possibly uh, implying that the district supports a candidate. Um, I personally am not here to debate whether that's right or wrong. I think the big issue for me last year was um, the campaign material, the packet, lays out with great specificity what a candidate needs to do. And if you don't follow the packet, you run the risk of jeopardizing your successful election. And so to me, there was no mention of that last year about prohibiting the use of logos. And um, so I think in the middle of the election campaign, having that changed uh, through correspondence with the district was very unsettling for the candidates who were impacted. Um, not here to let, you know worry about that. I personally think we just need to be clear one way or the other whether we are okay with district u uh, logo usage or not and just tell people in the packet and not worry about the basis of why or why not. Um, that's personally where I saw this coming, but no, I see you were a candidate. So. I, I agree. I, I don't feel one way or another whether logos should be used or shouldn't used. I just think that it needs to be determined and spelled out clearly in the packet. Right. Christine, so you want to read the statement? Would you like me to read the language? Okay. Sure, thanks. So the proposed language is use of district logos, mascots, or insignia. That's the title. And, and it says, please be advised that the use of district's logos, mascots, or insignia on any campaign materials or literature, including lawn, lawn signs, is considered a use of district resources. This is strictly forbidden under Board, Pol Board of Education Policy Number 1050 which prohibits the board from allowing its resources to be used for partisan activities. The appearance of the logos, mascots, or insignia on campaign materials, literature, or lawn signs of individual candidates may create the false impression that the district supports or endorses that candidacy, which could give rise to a voter challenge. Therefore, we ask you in advance for your cooperation. That was the proposed language. Okay, but that language is not specifically in the policy currently, right? That what you just said. It's not, it's not doesn't actually say No, that that's just policy. proposed right. language to so discuss right now. So are you asking right to now. change the policy? Are you asking to add that to this policy, that language? No, or to, just the, to, the to the packet. To the packet that goes out to new, can you know, to candidates okay. who pick up a packet. All right, because the, the, si the logos have been used for years, so. We have to decide, are we adding and they're this used as a by, I mean, the other thing is, like, they're used by String It Up. They're used by Lacrosse Unlimited. I mean, everyone's using these lo our logo everywhere. Where are we going to, you know, if we're saying it's a school resource, are we going to go after everyone who uses a school resource? Well, I mean, <coughs> I think the, the, the way that I look at the issue is the litigation risk in an election, right? So what is... Whether the policy says it, and we don't have to refer to that policy, Kate, in the campaign materials, if you feel strongly that that policy does not say that specifically, we don't have to refer to that policy. But to my mind, it's important to have it in the campaign materials so that we can avoid litigation, right? So that if some candidate down the road says, you know, that person used the Seahawk and you know they won, and I'm gonna sue the district, right? It's just avoiding that cost of litigation and the litigation risk. So whether the rules are clear or whether there's a case that says it specifically, I think that what we're hearing is that there's litigation risk. And so do we want to avoid the cost of that litigation risk in the election context? So I think what you're saying, Alex, yeah, it's a good point. You know, do we want to go out and sue everybody who uses the Seahawk? But the limited question here today is, do we want it in the campaign materials to avoid the litigation risk? And no, it seems like something easy to put in the campaign materials and we can avoid that risk. 
Maybe. It just always seemed to me like it was people showing school spirit, and we're not a community yeah. who like goes after people for school spirit. I, and there's I, no do law we, Can I ask you a question, Jack? Do we also limit, I'm not an attorney, but do we also limit our litigation risk if we put warding in saying the Cold Spring Harbor School District says any use of school lo logos does not directly show school endorsement of candidates? It, it, it's really hard to say whether that kind of disclaimer would get you out of the issue. What I think well, the only suit that was brought was lost, right? So there's no actual precedent that, yeah. I, I really wasn't going to discuss that. That's but, okay. But the case that you're talking about involved an unsuccessful candidate. I'm not really thinking about a candidate bringing a lawsuit against the district. I'm actually thinking more about a member of the community. And, and what, what Tammy's talking about is challenging the election results. Mm -hmm. And if you end up in that situation, you, the, the risk you run really is A, having somebody bring the challenge, and B, then having to defend, it would go to the commissioner because it clearly is a purely school district issue, and it would then be up to the commissioner to decide. The risk is in having to hire a lawyer to defend the district, but there's even a greater risk, which is that if the commissioner were to find that the use somehow resulted in the successful candidate being elected, the risk is having the results set aside and then having to conduct at some point another election. So well, perhaps really I'm so naive. I just I, I find it hard to believe that in this tiny community where people are running to volunteer their time to help out in their school district <laughs> that someone's going to sue another person because they lost a school board election. I'm, I'm not going to make a prediction on that. One yeah, way no, I, I understand that. I just, I think that this, uh, the, uh, there were a lot of, it was, there was a lot of effort put into this last year which seemed yeah. out of, um, the tone and tenor in which this community is typically run. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't feel comfortable as a school board getting behind that. So can that's I, my opinion. Can I ask a question though? Because I'm missing why this is an issue. People run on a platform. They run based on talking to the community. They run based on sitting in front of the community answering questions. Why does the logo matter why are people not just, like, what does it change anything? It doesn't. It doesn't. So then why are we spending time And there's no law against it. it. I, I, so know, then why are we spending time saying you can't use Protecting people's right it. to use it on a sign. Well, because right. we Or have, taking yeah. it away. Or taking it away. Because a mean, lot of time was spent on taking it away, and a message was sent out through an emergency I mean, system about it last year, about taking it away. Right, I which mean, to me is using a school resource as well, the text messaging system. But if... If it did come to a lawsuit, I mean, don't we look at precedent? We could say how many people on the current board and the last board used that sign, logo, whether they won or they lost, was never an issue before. <coughs> it was never taken into consideration. So why would that change? Well, the litigation risk is not, I mean, the litigation risk is defending that litigation as well, Kate, right? So if we can easily put a sentence in campaign materials to say, Please don't use, you know, the school resources, including the logo or the Seahawk. Then we avoid being sued and paying a lawyer. To Are we sure that. the school made the school Seahawk? Are we sure it was created by the school? Is it the school's resource? Do we know that? I'm just, I, I don't I know. Mean, Do we think the Booster Club made it at some point? I there's, I don't think that there's a record I of who actually created matter. that Seahawk. I, I. It dates back a long time. I mean, some of us have families who go way back here, and that Seahawk's been around a long time. So I don't know that anyone can probably claim ownership over that particular design. An another so question copy, I had, are, right? are we aware of any lawsuits um, in the state of New York where someone has sued, like, in a situation like this? Has there been litigation? Has against, there been litigation? Against, the law, against school districts. Yes. What, when a candidate to use the sign. There was a single case that occurred about three years ago in the North Shore School District. Is that the case you were just referencing before, the mm -hmm. same case? Yes. yes. And there was no decision, right, against? There was I no mean, decision against. It depends against. on how you problem, interpret the, the case. The but problem with that case is Jack, that can you just pull the, the person who closer? brought the challenge was challenging the fact that the unsuccessful candidate 
how you use the logo. The I commissioner said you can't. I think that case ha really had to do with pictures of kids and other, it wasn't just the logo, right? They had pictures of kids on there without permission, they were, they were putting signs next to signs. But so should we go, should we start putting that maybe into the packet too? Oh, your signs can't touch. Yeah. Right. I mean, we could, we could like, you know, Okay. I don't know. So, um, I know it's it's five of eleven. So, um, is this something that we want to decide right now? Do I we think we have to. We have to decide it right now. When are the packets, Christine? Oh, oh right. Yeah. yeah, they're not distributed. You could, on the March twenty fifth meeting, you could make a decision. Okay. Would everyone like with a? I'm ready to make a decision. Okay. Now. Okay. Uh, so let's, let's take a vote. Would we like to include? What so somebody's going to make a motion. What's oh. the recommendation? The recommendation is the language. Well, the rec to, to be included in the package. It wasn't right? necessarily a recommendation. The language was put forth as a possibility for discussion. No, I, I'm saying more. We have to have something to vote on. So I'm I'm going to finish. Right. So if we, I'll take a motion, <coughs> may to vote on including. Mm -hmm the language in the packet. So may I have a, a first to take a vote on whether or not to include, we're, we'll discuss after the motion if that's okay, right? Yeah. Well, so if you don't get a, mo a first. Yeah, okay. A motion, then that's okay, the may I have a first, Tammy, a second, Heather, discussion? So we're saying either we put the language in the packet and we're saying that you cannot use logos, or we're not saying anything, but kind of assuming that we're going to let people use logos? Is that, well, those are kind of the two choices? That's a very good question. We don't say that is a good question. Yeah, I think if the, the language, language in the packet, the motion on the table is to include the language so that we I read in the packet. But I think first we need to determine whether or not If there's alternate, well that language is saying that you agree that logos cannot be used. But by not including that? I don't think so. We never saying? had that before, right? We, we, so what, why do we have to determine No, he, that? she's saying if we say no to the language, are we saying? Yes to the logo. Right, yes, I don't yes. think so, personally. If no, I'm just saying I don't see that. Because saying no to that language into the packet, that doesn't mean we're saying you can use the logo. But then we're not really saying anything. Well, uh, so it, 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 to me, it's a right. non-issue. This whole thing right. is a non-issue. I agree. I'm, it's I'm a non-issue. But very, because, because sorry, legal letters a, were sent about this last year right. and candidates for, were brought up. No, no, no. I meant, I meant now it's a non-issue, right? So we need I don't to make ever want to see clear this now. again. That's the problem. It's, mm. yeah, it's it right. needs, I don't to, think it needs to be clear. I don't care which And it was made clear only to one person running for school board last year and not others when the packets were distributed. So now everyone should know. Right. We have to make it clear one way or the right. other, because it wasn't clear. It wasn't clear. Okay, so, so we have a pending so motion yeah. to mm -hmm. include this language, and then Lisa, I think we should take a second motion to further discuss okay. adding, you know, if Jack has a recommendation for other language to, that's pro logo, or that says it's okay. I, you don't think that yeah, there's I anything, Jack, though, clear. that's. I don't have, I'm not trying to change anything. I know, I know. That I'm language just is being proposed. Your motion is to include it. Yeah. At okay. At some point, you're going to have to vote whether you want to include it or not. If okay. You don't include we are, it, yes. It simply means that you don't have a prohibition in, that, your, right. in your paperwork. That's all it really Okay. Means. Thank you. Bingo. Okay. So we are now ready to vote. Is our discussion complete? Is everyone feeling good about the discussion, Lisa? Yeah. You ready? Yeah. Okay, so if you are in favor of including the language which would preclude people from using the logo, please raise your hand. So I wanna make a comment. I'm only in favor of it because there's no other proposal, so. Well, but we just said we could have a second discussion for alternate. Okay. Or we can continue to discuss alternate language. Do you want Which us to could go? include um, candidates are allowed to use logos, right? Right. Yeah, that or that we're not going to come after you if you use the logo. Yeah. Well, that's, but that's not the issue. The issue is whether a 
somebody in the community or a candidate sues the district. It's 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 about preventing that. So that that's I I, that's I just the don't issue. understand. And again, I didn't go to law school. Risk. But um, I don't understand why if we have a statement saying we as a school board do not feel the use of the logo is a school endorsement of, I mean, there's the PAL kids are running around with the school logo all over them. Are we endorsing their sports program? Like, we're not, you know, that's run by parents. I haven't been so, that question, so I'm gonna But I, I, I think is it's a valid question. There's plenty of people who use our logo, which may or may not belong to us, because we're not sure who made it, but who use our logo who then run programs using our logo. So is our school endorsing them? Me? Is this a Here's question for I'm policy? I'm not talking about a copyright or trademark violation. That's not the issue. That, and that's the issue I think Christine, you're can you just move No, I, I'm over. not. I, I, this is not a trademark or copyright issue. No, I don't I'm not know saying if you they, own yeah. the, the Cold Spring Harbor Eagle as both. your... As, He's as a Seahawk. Seahawk. I'm sorry. <laughs> as, if you hadn't already guessed, I try. If you hadn't already guessed, I try to stay out of these these things. You're not from Philadelphia, are you? I can't tell. I can't tell you who owns the trademark. The question is whether it's considered a district resource, and that's not an answer I can give you. But it is the issue that was litigated. Bless you. Here. I, I have no problems with your deciding not to include bless bless you. You. Okay. not to include the language. I'm just not sure that I think it's a good idea for you to say you can because but it's not really your issue. It's going to yeah. be somebody else who's going to decide. Okay. And it's likely not going to be you suing a candidate. It's going to I'm be a candidate sue suing the, okay. the, the board to set aside the election results. That's it. the only thing I can anticipate. So okay, the only way to protect ourselves from being, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm the sorry. only way to protect ourselves from being sued is to say you cannot use the logo? Uh, yes. I believe that that's true. Now, for in this one very specific niche possibility. No question. Yes. Okay. So, thank you, Jack, but you also think it's okay for us to not include it. I don't think you have to. Okay. Thank I you. I, I think it's as a precaution, to use Tammy's term, to avoid litigation risk, y yes. But that's about it. OK. Should we start the vote over? Sure. Or, all right. If you now, with that with the continued information, if you are in favor of including the language that would preclude people from using the school logo on campaign signs and materials, Please raise your hand. It's if it that's it. it, it doesn't pass. It does branch. not pass. Okay. Thank you. Happy All news. right, now on to everyone. Oh, so we also have transfer to capital and regents review. I'd like to make a motion to move those items to the meeting on the twenty fifth. She can place them on the table. Yeah, you can just place on the table. It's not a place it on the table. Yeah, can I? Okay, yeah. I'm just gonna, if that's okay, it's 11.02, yes, okay. Um, so, uh, do I need, need, need a motion for that or just table it? No, you should take a motion. May I have a motion to table. place those two items on the table? May I have a first, Lisa, second, Heather, any discussion? All in favor, thank you. May I have a motion to adjourn, please? Bruce Sullivan. Thank you. Lisa, thank you. All in favor? That's a wrap. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone.